Okay, perfect. Should be all set. Uh, Good morning again. My name is Jennifer Plichta, uh, and I'm going to be your host for today. Welcome to our sixth annual What's Best for Breast, a conversation with clinicians. Um, this is uh, being held virtual again this year due to uh, COVID that's been going on for the last several years now, but hopefully next year we're going to be in person, but we appreciate you tuning in this morning. Um, we're going to go ahead and get started here. Uh, so I happen to be the director of our high-risk clinic here at Duke, and I'm also a breast surgeon. Um, our presenting sponsor for today's event is Invite, who is joining us, and we thank them for their continued support. They've supported us from the beginning, and without them, this event would not be possible. There will be an opportunity to fill out a survey at the end of today's uh, presentations, uh, so please do share your thoughts with us. Let us know how you think how things went, um, things that you enjoyed, things that you thought could be better, what you'd like to see in the future. Uh, we really do value your feedback and try to tailor this event to uh, what you think it would be the most helpful. And now I'd like to introduce uh, Dr. Shelley Wong. She is the Distinguished Press Professor of Surgery. She's the Vice Chair of Research in the Department of Surgery. And she's also the Breast Cancer Disease Group Lead for the Duke Cancer Institute. Uh, so Shelley, if you'd like to say a few words, please go ahead. Yes, good morning. Can everyone hear me? Yes, we can. Okay, terrific. Uh, well, I would just like to add uh, to Jennifer's Welcome. Um, I think this is a really terrific event that we're able to put on every year. Um, and really, it is thanks to um, Dr. Plicta and her amazing team who are able to um, gather together and come up with a terrific agenda. The main reason that we're here today is that despite all the um, progress that we've made in breast cancer treatment, mm -hmm. um, there's still over 250,000 women who are diagnosed with breast cancer every year. And um, I think all of us know uh, somebody who's been directly affected by breast cancer. So um, there's still a lot of work for us all to do. Um, we at both UNC and Duke and across the triangle um, are involved in many efforts to try to improve care for patients who have breast cancer. But also I think as this uh, meeting will highlight, it's really important to know about how to preserve one's breast health. Um, so it's not all about what to do when you get cancer, but how to um, stay as healthy as possible. So um, I just wanted to thank Dr. Plicta and her team uh, for another really great meeting, and uh, I think you'll you'll enjoy it. Thank you so much. Thank you, Dr. Wong. We appreciate you joining us this morning. Uh, so just a quick run through of today's agenda. Uh, we're gonna give some of these welcoming remarks, then we'll hear from a survivor. Uh, we'll have our first education session. We'll take a short break. We'll do the second educational block. Again, take a nice little short break. We'll have our third education block. And then there will be the opportunity at the end to stay on for some additional time if you would like to uh, meet with a few other groups. Um, we have people from Invite, from another group called Commotion. Uh, Duke Breast Surgery will be represented. Force will be participating, Karis Life Sciences, the DCI Community Outreach Engagement and Equity Team, and then BCEP will also be present. So now I'd like to shift gears and introduce our first speaker for today, and that is Valerie Worthy. I know Valerie in many ways. I consider her a friend and a colleague, uh, but one of the things uh, that she's going to share with us today is her story. So she is actually a breast cancer survivor, and I will let her uh, share her story from here. And then Valerie, um, I think this is what you wanted me to show. So go ahead. Thank you. So it's a pleasure being here. Um, gosh, I am so excited because I think over the years, I am now a 23 year breast cancer survivor, but over the 23 years, I think my story hasn't changed, but it's, it's focused more now on, I would say the glass is half full instead of it being uh, half empty. So I thought maybe I could share what Dorothy went through when the tornado hit Kansas. And that's how I felt when I was diagnosed. Um, my whole world changed and I felt actually that I was in another place. And all I ever wanted to do was get back to my Kansas. And so along the way, I met some incredible people, some interesting people. And when I started um, my journey, I was so frightened, so afraid, and I was trying to listen to everything that absolutely everybody was saying, including Google and friends that had never been diagnosed, but 
they sounded as if they were experts. And some of the things people would tell me would be, don't have surgery because if you do, the cancer is spread all over your body. Um, others would say things like, um, eat this and don't do that. And then I went to Mr. Google and that just frightened me. So I saw a lot of wizards along my way. But then when I was treated at Duke, I found kind hearted people. Of course, you know, I feel like Duke Cancer Center is the best cancer center in the world. I'm a little biased, but I found people that understood my diagnosis. I also found people that had the courage to not only treat me, but to go beyond that treatment and find other clinical trials that would help people. And then I found caring staff from those that transported me from x-ray to x-ray to those that were at the desk and handed me paperwork. These people had a heart. And then my surgeon and my breast oncologist and my radiation oncologist were just wonderful. And they, they took the time and, and you know, Duke Cancer Center is a very busy place, but they took the time to talk to me and to explain what I would be going through. And as they began to explain all of my treatments, I felt that I was a little bit closer to getting to Kansas. So as I was going through all of this, there was my, what I call my good witch Glenda, my team, my family, my church, and they would all come together and they would help me piece out certain parts of this pathway. And what I've learned over the time is that good people will come my way. Good people will come all of our ways. And we just have to be open to hearing the good things that people are saying. And then our glass kind of inverts and it really does uh, end up being half full. And just as Dorothy got back to Kansas, I found out there were ways for me to get back to my Kansas and get back to life and get back to living and going back to the things that I enjoy. So now I'm a patient navigator at Duke Cancer Center, wow. Um, and I get an opportunity to help people get back to their Kansas. And so now I can see the rainbow and it's a beautiful rainbow and every opportunity that I get to help patients to stand beside these beautiful and willing workers at our cancer center, then I know that my diagnosis wasn't in vain and that I can help people along the way. So this is just a snippet of my story, but I just wanted to leave you with something positive. Yeah, it was scary at the beginning, but in the end, I saw just the value in every single step that I took. And I thank Dr. Plitka and her team for just inviting me just to share this story. Thanks again. Thank you, Valerie. Thank you so much for being here today. Uh, I'm sure she was planning to attend as she usually does, uh, but I don't know that she was planning on speaking until about 24 hours ago. <laughs> so uh, we had another speaker who was going to join us and unfortunately was unable to, but uh, thank you so much, Valerie, for being here. I always find your story so inspirational and uh, just really appreciate you and all that you do. Thank you. So we're going to get started then in our first uh, education session, and these topics in the first block are going to be myth busters, always fun to see what you know and don't know. We'll have a little bit of uh, information about primary care for women's health and breastfeeding, and then we'll talk about breast cancer risk and genetics. And then our last topic for this session will be breast imaging. I'm super excited about the next person I'm going to introduce, which is Dr. Philip Spanheimer. He's a surgical oncologist at UNC. Now, you didn't think I'd bring the other color blue here today, but I certainly did. Uh, we are definitely a team here in the uh, triangle, and we're super excited to have UNC involved with us. He is our first UNC faculty to join us in What's Best for Breast, so I hope that everybody gives him a very warm welcome. So hopefully they'll participate again next year, because we would love to have more UNC involved in this event because we know how important it is to our community. Uh, so I'm going to go ahead and stop sharing my slides, and I'm going to let uh, Dr. Spanheimer go ahead and take over. I don't think we can hear you. 
Uh, I can't. There you go. Uh, I can't turn on my video, and I don't have this. Am I supposed to have the slides for this session? Oh nope, there's no slides. Okay. So you can just go ahead and introduce your speakers, oh. and they'll share yeah. their slides. Do you want? Can I turn my video on? So sure, go ahead. Please do. Host has stopped it. Oh, interesting. I would understand if no one wants to look at me either. <laughs> Uh, let's see if that helps. How does that help? Does that work? Yes. Thank you. Sure. So uh, thank you, Dr. Plikta, for that uh, nice introduction. And thank you to everyone for attending the session today. Uh, we have a truly excellent lineup of speakers and some important and interesting topics. If you have any questions, please type them in the chat or send them directly to me. And please do that so we're not uh, listening to me talk for a while at the end. Uh, so our first speaker is Sydney Record. Uh, Sydney is a medical student in the class of 2023 at Duke University, and today she'll be talking about some common myths in breast cancer. Hello. I also don't have permission to share my video, which is fine. I can just share my slides. Oh, but now I do. Thank you, Dr. Plikta. <laughs> um, I just wanted to say thank you to Dr. Plikta for being such an incredible mentor and allowing me to be a part of this event. Um, so we're gonna start with uh, my Mythbusters talk. So um, anyone can use the chat or you can call out um, after each myth I present um, for everyone to see if they think it's true or false, and then we'll discuss whether they are true or false and why. We'll get started with our first myth, which is most lumps in your breast are not breast cancer. So go ahead and put in the chat or call out whether you think this is true or false. Okay, I appear to have clicked it. Yes, so this one is um, true. And this is true. Most lumps in the breast are benign and not breast cancer. However, that me that still doesn't mean that you shouldn't see a doctor. So if you um, notice a persistent lump in your breast or any changes in breast tissue, um, you should still go see a doctor and get uh, a clinical breast exam to get this evaluated better. Oh, someone's saying chat is disabled. I guess Q&A um, works. Yes, Q&A. Please put yeah. your yes. comments and things in the Q&A. Yes, okay, perfect. Sorry, I should have said Q&A, not chat. Um, okay, so we'll move on to our next myth, which is that wearing deodorant can cause breast cancer. So is this true or false? One falls. Yes, and that's correct. Um, the National Cancer Institute has not found any link between use of underarm deodorant and development of breast cancer, which is obviously great news. Okay, next myth is um, if someone has a family of family history of breast cancer, this means they absolutely will get breast cancer. Is this true or false? Okay, I'm not seeing any guesses, but this one is also false. Um, so family history is absolutely a risk for breast cancer and something that um, every woman should be taking into account when she thinks about her risk for breast cancer. But not every woman with a family history will develop breast cancer. And then most women with breast cancer actually don't have a family history. Um, so the flip side of this is just because you don't have a family history doesn't mean um, you won't develop breast cancer. Okay, another one. This one's a good one. Does alcohol increase the risk of breast cancer? Any guesses for true or false on this one? Oh, wow. There are lots of guesses. Okay. Um, this one, we have some guesses for true, and that is correct. Um, so it increases risk of breast cancer by raising levels of estrogen in the body. Um, and so one way to reduce breast cancer risk can be um, not drinking alcohol or cutting back on one's intake. And obviously there's like a big spectrum of what alcohol intake is. Um, and it's not a black or white. If you drink alcohol, you increase your risk. And if you don't drink alcohol, you, you don't have any risk. It really depends on the amount of exposure. Okay. And now we've got our next myth. Um, which is that your bra could cause breast cancer. See some guesses, seeing false. Yes. So false is the correct answer. Um, there was a study by the Division of Public Health Sciences and it found no difference in the breast cancer risk between women who wore a bra and women who didn't. Next one is man, men can get breast cancer. 
guess is on this one. True. Yep. So those are that is correct. Men can get breast cancer. It's relatively rare, but about 2,700 men get breast cancer in the United States every year. So just like women, if they notice any or people of any gender, um, if they notice any changes in uh, breast tissue, it's always best to see a doctor and get a clinical breast exam. The next one is do regular mammograms prevent breast cancer? True or false? Seeing one guess for false. Yeah, so this one has some mixed responses, which is expected. This is one of our tricky ones. Uh, the answer is false, and that's because um, mammography is used to detect breast cancer that's already there, so it can't prevent breast cancer, but it's still really important to get um, regularly screened in order to detect any breast cancers early, because the best way to make it through breast cancer is with early detection. And then next myth is um, women who, oh, sorry, we'll pretend we didn't see that. Women who have had breast cancer can still breastfeed, whether that's true or false. I might have given this one away though. Yes. So this one is true. Um, so if a child drinks from a breast that has breast cancer, they, that, that child will not get breast cancer. However, um, cancerous breasts typically don't produce as much milk. So um, they often find that children prefer the breast that does not have cancer in it. Okay. And then uh, injury or trauma to the breast can cause, like getting hit in the breast can cause breast cancer. Is this true or false? Okay, got one vote for false. Yep, a couple of votes for false. And that is correct. So getting it hit in the breast won't cause breast cancer, but it can cause fat necrosis, which causes like a benign lump. It's scarring from the trauma, um, which can make people think that they have breast cancer, but it's um, a benign lump. And then here's another one. Um, does dyeing your hair cause breast cancer? Have another guess for false, false. So this one's actually kind of tricky. Um, older studies um, did not find any risk. So those of you who said false, um, that's in line with the majority of the evidence, but some recent studies have actually found that there's possibly um, a little bit of a link, um, but not enough for any recommendations to be based on this right now. So definitely an area to kind of keep watching and uh, see where the evidence ends up pointing. And that's the only mixed evidence one. So don't worry about guessing mixed evidence again. Um, and then is all breast cancer the same, true or false? False. Yes, everyone who gets false, that's correct. There are so many different subtypes of breast cancer. It could be a whole talk in and of itself, but just knowing that every type is different and requires a different mode of treatment and um, your team will be there to customize treatment for you if you ever have to go through this is kind of the takeaway from this myth. And so in summary, just want to say that um, knowing and learning about what is true and what isn't, um, not taking everything you hear um, at a surface level can help you take control of your health. Um, and if you ever are in doubt or want to get some um, help or reassurance, you can always see your healthcare provider. So thank you guys for letting me talk. Thank you, Sydney. That was a great talk. Uh, our next speaker is Dr. Andrea Dotson. She will be discussing women's health uh, and breastfeeding. Dr. Dotson received her medical degree from Our Shade of Blue over here at UNC uh, and then continued on to do her family medicine residency at the University of New Mexico before returning to the Triangle area for a fellowship uh, in primary care research at UNC. Uh, after that, she started as primary care practice with Duke Health uh, and we're looking forward to her talk on women's health and breastfeeding. Thank you. Good morning, all. I'm going to just share my screen. Okay. 
So we're going to talk a little bit this morning, and this is going to be really brief just for time on breastfeeding and women's health. And as Sydney mentioned, please send any questions to the Q&A um, that we can maybe address at the end. Um, so just a little bit about what are the recommendations for breastfeeding. Um, we've had some updates this year. So um, American Academy of Pediatrics just updated their recommendation from exclusive breastfeeding for six months with the introduction of foods for infant at six months and continued breastfeeding previously had been till one year and has been updated this year to say two years or longer as desired by um, both the mother and infant. We have um, American Academy of Family Physicians um, also says six months of exclusive breastfeeding um, with introduction of complementary foods and breastfeeding for one year or longer. Um, American College of Obstetricians and Gynecologists, very similar. And then we have WHO matches more of the update from um, the Academy of Pediatrics uh, to say six months of exclusive breastfeeding with continued breastfeeding and complementary foods through two years or longer. And important highlights, many of these things, these recommendations um, include how it's mutually desired by both mother and infant with that recognition that there may be weaning at different points um, depending on the dyad, meaning the mom and the infant's desires. So why do we recommend breastfeeding? I think this is important to kind of talk about. There are two or more um, uh, patients involved when we're talking about breastfeeding. So both the mom and the baby or babies, depending on um, if there's twins or more. So when we talk about benefits to a mother or the lactating parent, we talk about there is good evidence showing reduction in breast cancer and ovarian cancer. Um, with breastfeeding. Um, many, much of that evidence includes breastfeeding duration, um, and that can include over several um, breastfeeding experiences with several children. We know that there's a lifetime reduction in the development of type 2 diabetes for mothers who breastfeed. In the immediate um, postpartum period, we know there's a reduction in postpartum depression with breastfeeding. We know lifetime, there's additional benefits with reduced risk of osteoporosis or bone thinning, and then really good evidence on reduced risk of cardiovascular disease, specifically around high blood pressure, um, meaning development of hypertension, and then also reduced lifetime risk of heart disease related to heart attacks. Other benefits that are a little harder to um, show medical evidence is a reduced cost for um, families to breastfeed. And then we know when the infants have reduced illness, which I'll talk about in the next slide, that that typically means less absence for parents from work. Um, and we also think there's a lot of um, reduced waste compared to formula production. When we talk about what's the benefits for babies, um, really good evidence of medical benefits for the infant with breastfeeding. We know that there's a reduced risk of otitis media or ear infections, reduced incidence or risk of gastroenteritis, so meaning um, kind of like stomach bugs. And with that necrotizing intercolitis, which is typically found in our really early babies. Um, and so we know that we really want to breastfeed babies that are born prematurely. There's lower risk of respiratory tract infections, specifically those that are lower respiratory tract infections. And with that asthma development, reduced risk of eczema. There's a reduced risk of childhood obesity with some evidence that breastfed babies may also have a reduced risk of adult that obesity, those trials are still ongoing and developing. Um, we also know that there's a lower risk for children that were breastfed for the development of type 2 diabetes as well as type 1 diabetes, um, and very good evidence for reduced uh, incidence risk of childhood leukemia for infants that were breastfed, as well as for sudden infant death syndrome. But we know that sometimes moms stop breastfeeding before those recommended um, times that we talked about in the first slide. So the most common reasons that we have identified for why families, why mothers may stop breastfeeding um, soon is problems with lactation and latching, 
Um, also worries around nutrition and weight for their infant, concerns about taking medication. So when there are certain medications that are prescribed without uh, medical assistance in terms of those are safe or not safe for breastfeeding, workplace policies that don't support breastfeeding. We're going to talk about there are legal um, ramifications for employers in terms of support for breastfeeding, but we know sometimes those workplace policies are challenging to implement. Cultural pressures or lack of family support and then unsupportive hospital practices can lead to um, mothers and families feeling like they stop before they are recommended or before they were ready. So some helpful tips I have, talk to family and friends if you're going to be breastfeeding and get your family and friends to be on board with that plan early before baby arrives. Talk about specific ways family and friends, depending on their skill set, can help with breastfeeding uh, because really this is a whole village support system. So families can help with chores and cooking and changing diapers, soothing baby, reading to baby, all ways to help while you breastfeed baby. Talking to your medical team, so your doctor and midwife, particularly in the prenatal period about maybe some risks that you might have or difficulties for breastfeeding. And I've listed some here um, that we know are associated with challenges to breastfeeding and then discuss ways to prevent or address these issues. And also identify your medical team, your support team for after baby arrives. Who are you going to reach out to for help with breastfeeding if challenges do come up? And what does that support team look like? That might not necessarily be your team that helped you prenatally. And then talking to your employer. So I've listed here the... Um, the laws that exist for supporting uh, breastfeeding and working mothers, lactating parents, and what rights you have as an employee um, to talk with your employer about. Um, and also discuss a plan for pumping with your medical provider for when you're going back to work. Since we're talking about um, a lot of things related to breast cancer today, I wanted to make sure we talk about breast cancer screening while breastfeeding. Um, so we know that there are times where we do need to do breast cancer screening while mothers and lactating parents may still be breastfeeding. So talking about your individual risk, lifetime risk of breast cancer with your provider is really important and how long you might be breastfeeding. We do know that mammography, breast ultrasound, and breast MRI are safe during lactation, um, but there may be other reasons families want to delay until breastfeeding is complete. So really understanding your risk and how long you plan to breastfeed is very important. And then if it's determined that you need screening while breastfeeding, just be sure to breastfeed or express breast milk before your screening appointment can help images um, look good enough for um, evaluation. When we're talking about what happens if you have breast cancer or you've had breast cancer and breastfeeding, and I'm so happy Sydney talked about um, if you've had breast cancer, you can still breastfeed. Um, if you have breast cancer, you can still breastfeed. Um, so some breast cancer treatments we do know can change our lactational capacity, meaning the amount of breast tissue we have for breastfeeding. There may also be some medicines that are challenging with breastfeeding. So really the most important thing is talking to your oncology team and talking to a breastfeeding medicine expert so that you have a plan in place and then getting really close postpartum follow-up with your medical team that includes that breastfeeding medicine expert and your oncologist so that you have a plan going forward and you can develop a support system. And thank you for having me. Happy to take any questions when we do that later on. Thank you, Dr. Dobson. Uh, our next speaker is Jackie White. Uh, she's a breast surgery nurse practitioner at Duke with a special interest in caring for patients at increased risk of developing breast cancer. In addition to being one of the providers in their breast risk assessment clinic, she also sees patients with benign breast conditions and works collaboratively with Dr. Pukta in caring for breast surgery patients. Today, she'll be talking about understanding the risk of breast cancer. Good morning and thank you. Let me just share my screen here.
So this morning, I'm going to talk about breast cancer risk and understanding uh, the risk of developing breast cancer. We're going to talk about briefly talk about the causes of breast cancer, risk factors uh, related to breast cancer, which uh, Sydney and Dr. Dotson have both touched based on briefly in their presentations. And we're also gonna talk about breast cancer risk reduction. <clears throat> so what causes breast cancer? We actually don't know the cause of most breast cancers. We know it's likely related to changes within the DNA or our gen genetic material. And those changes can be related to lifestyle, uh, choices, but some can be due to aging or even changes within our genetic makeup. So what are risk factors? Risk factors are anything that can increase or decrease a person's chance of getting a disease. As Sydney mentioned in the Mythbusters, having a risk factor or even several does not mean that you will definitely get breast cancer. It just increases your chances of developing uh, breast cancer within your lifetime. And again, it is possible for people to have one or several and remain healthy throughout their entire life. So more, more on risk factors. Uh, there are some that you can change and some that you cannot change. So risk factors that you cannot change. One, being born female is the main risk factor for developing breast cancer. Getting older, um, unfortunately we can't change that. Um, and the risk increases with age. We know that the vast majority of individuals who develop breast cancer are over the age of 55, but certainly we know that there are younger individuals that develop breast cancer as well. <clears throat> Family history, a woman who has a close blood relative with breast cancer is at a higher risk Again, it does not mean that just because you have a family history that you will get breast cancer, but it does increase your risk. And this is true for individuals with the first degree relative, um, most importantly, but also other individuals within the family as well. And this is true for either mom's side of the family or dad's side of the family. Additional risk factors that you cannot change. Um, certain individuals who have um, benign non-cancer breast problems, such as atypia, so that's atypical ductal hyperplasia, atypical lobular hyperplasia, or LCIS or lobular carcinoma in situ, they have a slightly increased risk of developing breast cancer. A history of chest radiation. Individuals who have radiation to their chest, such as those who had childhood cancer and received a large dose of radiation to their chest, are at an increased risk. Dense breast tissue. So women with denser breast tissue, and this is a seen on mammogram, have a slightly higher risk of developing breast cancer. Dr. Lowell likely touched base on this as well in regards to her presentation on breast cancer imaging. Um, additional factors that you cannot change. Unfortunately, uh, you can change this, but uh, not every individual can change it, but not having children or having them later in life and later in life is after the age of 30, puts a woman at slightly higher risk. Additionally, our menstrual cycles or our exposure to um, hormones throughout our lifetime through our menstrual cycles. So having periods at a younger age, so less than the age of 12, or going through menopause later, um, so after the age of 50, and kind of that span of time of exposure, our body being exposed to hormones. Genetic mutations. This is something, unfortunately, we cannot change. Our genes we get from mom and we get from dad. The good news is, is about 10% of all breast cancer diagnoses are thought um, to be related to genetic mutations, but that means that 90% are not, that 90% of breast cancer diagnoses are sporadic. So those lifestyle changes that we mentioned, um, unfortunately aging, um, those are more likely the cause of developing breast cancer uh, re rather than a genetic mutation. Um, I think the media has really um, shed light on BRCA1 and BRCA2 mutations. However, there are many other mutations that we know are associated with breast cancer. Just for reference, um, as Dr. Plicta's initial slide mentioned, one in eight women will be develop, will develop breast cancer within their lifetime. So about a 12 and a half percent risk um, throughout their life. BRCA mutation carriers carry up to a 40 to 70 percent um, breast cancer risk. So how do we know who to test um, for breast cancer uh, 
related gene mutations. And again, here's just a slide of some of the others aside from the BRCA1 and BRCA2. So when do we know to check for all these various mutations? Uh, we have guidelines that help guide us. These are the most recent guidelines that are actually for 2023. Um, so just hitting the highlights on some of this, um, anyone diagnosed with breast cancer less than the age of 50, anyone diagnosed with triple negative disease breast cancer at any age, or a known genetic mutation within the family. And you'll see on the side here, um, albeit very small print, um, but there are a lot of other guidelines that recommend in terms of recommendations uh, for when to undergo testing. <clears throat> Jumping back to risk factors. So these are risk factors that you can change. So we just talked about all of them that unfortunately we don't have much um, ability to change, but there are factors that we in our lifetime can change. One is our physical activity. We don't know that being less active increases your risk. Being overweight, uh, especially um, a higher BMI after menopause is linked to breast cancer risk. Postmenopausal women uh, who receive hormone replacement therapy for prolonged periods of time. Um, that prolonged period of time is anywhere greater than five to 10 years um, and more so with combined therapy with estrogen and progesterone. As we mentioned before, alcohol use, there is a risk um, of increased alcohol relates to increased breast cancer risk. So what, what, there is no way to prevent breast cancer. There are ways to reduce the risk of developing breast cancer. So as I mentioned, there are things we can change. So in reducing our risk, um, we want to stay healthy. <clears throat> And we want to maintain or achieve a BMI of less than 30. And BMI is calculated through your height and your weight. Oftentimes, this is uh, calculated at your um, healthcare provider visits. So you're always welcome to ask your healthcare provider um, kind of where your BMI stands. Uh, being physically active, uh, we know that increased activity of at least 150 minutes of moderate activity per week is recommended. So about 30 minutes, five days a week and limiting alcohol use. So no more than one drink per day is the general recommendation. In regards to risk reduction, um, <clears throat> there are medical treatments that some women are eligible to receive, and this is dependent on family history of breast cancer, personal history of atypia, or having a known genetic mutation. This is, um, there's the option of chemo prevention. Uh, so a pill that some women take um, for a per period of time that helps to reduce their risk of developing breast cancer. There's also preventative surgery. Uh, this tends to be reserved for individuals with very high risk of uh, cancer. Um, and there are risks associated with that um, as well. So wanting to discuss that further with the healthcare provider regarding the benefit versus risk of that option. So what's important is knowing what is your risk. So we know that not all women are the same. Um, each woman has their own risk factors. Um, so it's important to talk to your healthcare provider about what is your risk. Um, there are risk calculation models. Um, so in the breast cancer risk assessment clinic, we actually utilize these models to determine uh, a woman's uh, lifetime risk of developing breast cancer in order to re recommend appropriate screening um, and uh, prevention treatments. So in summary, there are many risk factors for breast cancer. Some you can change and some you can't. Every woman can take uh, steps to reduce their risk of developing breast cancer but it's important to know your risk and it's important to discuss this with your healthcare provider. Thank you so much. Thank you, Jackie. That was an excellent talk and very clearly presented. Um, our last speaker, but certainly not least, is Dr. Dorothy Lowell. Um, Dr. Lowell is an assistant professor of radiology uh, at the Duke University School of Medicine and the assistant director of the radiology residency program. Dr. Lowell will be discussing breast imaging. It's nice to see you, Philip. Um, thank you all. Thank you for inviting me to talk. Um, I'm going to be talking about breast imaging. So let me get my screen shared. Oh, let me start with screen share here. Screen share. 
And let me put this on slideshow. All right, and I'm gonna move this over so I can see. All right, great. So thank you all for attending. It's um, It's been such an informative morning already. So what I'm gonna talk about is breast imaging. And um, what I'm gonna go over is some key facts about screening, the breast imaging tools that we have at our disposal in radiology. And we'll talk a little bit about density. Jackie, we're right, I am gonna talk about density. <laughs> so we'll start with some facts about screening. So does screening mammography work? The short answer is yes. We have lots of data for this. So breast cancer rates have decreased um, by about 0.4% per year, or increased 0.4% per year from 7, 1975 to 89. In about 1989, when we implemented screening, the deaths from breast cancer declined by 39%. Over 300,000 breast cancer deaths have been averted in women through, um, through 2015. And from 2006 to 2015, breast cancer deaths have declined every year by 2.6%. The decline is due to both improved treatment and early detection. So does screening mammography work? Yes, early detection leads to improved treatment options. Let's talk about the tools at, that at our disposal in radiology. We'll talk about film mammography, digital mammography, 3D or tomosynthesis mammography, ultrasound and MRI. So it's hard to believe, but actually mammograms have been done for over a hundred years. It wasn't until 1965 that we had the first commercial system of mammography. It looked like this and the pictures look like this. I think they were a bit uninterpretable. We just got these white images of breasts, but I don't know that we could really de delineate normal from abnormal on those pictures. In the 1980s and 90s, film mammography systems were invented and the image quality certainly improved where we get mammograms that look more similar to what we see today. In the 2000s, we had our first digital mammography and the film quality greatly improved with our digital mammography um, images. So you can see just throughout the years, the changes in the quality of the images, probably similar to the quality of the images that you get from your, your cameras and now what we have on our iPhones. But there's still a problem. The problem is that breast cancers can, early breast cancers, our whole goal of screening is to catch a very early breast cancer. And early breast cancers can be very, very tiny and can look like the surrounding tissue. So the newest and latest imaging technology is 3D mammography or tomosynthesis mammography. And what that means is what we used to have are a digital mammography, the regular 2D mammogram uses a single X-ray coming from the top of the machine and it creates a single 2D image. That's the traditional mammogram that we think of. 3D or tomosynthesis mammography takes multiple low dose images throughout multiple different planes or angles of the breast and compiles those pictures into what we call a tomosynthesis or 3D mammogram. These are low dose images equivalent to about the whole mammogram, a whole screening mammogram, the amount of radiation is about equivalent to seven weeks of normal background radiation. And again, that x-ray machine on a 3D mammogram kind of turns, it rotates over 15 degrees and gets us multiple images of the breast through different planes. And it gives us a 3D picture of the breast. This can be really, really helpful, particularly in women with dense breasts. And I'll talk more about what dense breasts mean here later in this talk. But this is our routine mammogram in this patient. And I think on this routine mammogram, it can be a little challenging to see um, if there's anything abnormal here. Every, there um, looks like fibroglandular tissue, but it's hard to see if there's a mass. When we have the 3D mammogram, we can scroll through and I'll show you what that looks like but it brings out that there's a mass with some what we call architectural distortion or tugging of the breast tissue underneath some of the, the overlying normal breast tissue. And what I mean by underneath is we can actually play through the mammogram in the reading room. Sometimes it, when you're waiting for your results or the, the radiologists are probably scrolling through your mammogram, just gonna pay attention right here as that mass comes into focus. And we can scroll through the breast, we can scroll through the normal tissue or the planes of normal tissue to see if there's any abnormalities um, that, that is being 
um, overlied by normal breast tissue. And again, that mass is right here on this breast. Now I can play that one more time on this. Um, but that's the beauty of 3D mammogram is that we can scroll through normal breast tissue to see if there are any abnormalities or unhealthy breast tissue hiding amongst normal breast parenchyma. This is just another example of an older mam or a routine mammogram hiding what looks like a spiculated mass or lines coming out from the mass or a breast cancer that would be very hard to see, if not impossible to see on a 2D mammogram alone where tomosynthesis makes it much more visible. When a mammogram is performed, the x-rays actually come from the top of the machine. And this is a shield that keeps the face and the eyes out of the picture and out of the beam of radiation. The compression panel, what makes mammograms particularly uncomfortable is actually very, very helpful. The compression helps get us better imaging quality. And actually the more compression, the less radiation there is to the breast. Underneath is the plate or the detector. That's what receives the x-ray information and actually makes the, the pictures for the radiologist to see. Mammogram is great, but it's not perfect. So out of 100 women who get a screening mammogram, 90 will be told that their mammograms are normal. 10 will be asked to return for additional images. Of those 10, Six will be reassured that everything was normal. It was just their normal breast tissue kind of overlapping on the mammogram or nothing to worry about. Two of those 10 will be asked to return in six months for something that we consider probably benign. That's probably nothing, but we'd like to follow it closely. And then two out of 100 will be recommended to have a needle biopsy. So while screening mammography is great, we still sometimes need to take extra pictures. And a lot of times when we take extra pictures, it just means that everything is normal, but it can help us um, determine if somebody needs a biopsy or not. Breast ultrasound is another tool we have at our disposal. It uses sound waves to see inside the breast. There's no radiation associated with ultrasound. It's the same technology we use to look at babies inside the womb. Ultrasound can help us see if there's an irregular gray mass on ultrasound that looks like a breast cancer or a benign cyst that looks like just an oval or a black oval um, and well circumscribed oval will be a benign cyst. But again, ultrasound is also not perfect. Sometimes breast cancers in benign masses can have similar features and we may have to do an ultrasound guided biopsy to make sure we're not missing something because some of these things can overlap on ultrasound pictures. Breast MRI is another tool that we have in the department to look inside the breast. An MRI uses a combination of radio waves and magnets to see inside the breast. There's no radiation associated with an MRI. There's also no compression, which makes it a little bit more uh, um, comfortable of an exam. But a patient does have to lay on their stomach kind of in the superwoman position to get the pictures that we need. And it requires IV contrast or dye in inside the vein so that we can light up what is normal and abnormal in the breast on the MRI pictures. MRI is great. It shows us, it um, can show us the very earliest forms of cancer and it is very good at detecting very, very early cancers. The tricky thing with MRI is that sometimes normal tissue can also enhance and trick us just like mammogram pictures and ultrasound pictures. There can be a lot of false alarms associated with a breast MRI, um, especially a first breast MRI, where we're trying to figure out what's normal for you. Additionally, Breast MRI is the most expensive test that we have. It costs a lot of money and may not be worth it for all patients, but may be something to discuss if a patient is at very high risk for breast cancer. What is this about density? Thank you, Jackie, for setting me up. We'll talk about breast density. So when we read a mammogram, we are required to um, comment on the breast density. And there's four densities that we can, um, that we, we categorize women into. Almost entirely fatty is the first breast density. Scattered fiber glandular tissue is the second. Heterogeneously dense and extremely dense. And what this means is really how much white are we seeing on the mammogram? So a breast is composed of fibrous tissue, glandular or milk making tissue and fat. Fat on a mammogram looks black on the mammogram, whereas fibrous and glandular tissue look white. The tricky thing is 
breast cancers and other breast abnormalities also look white on mammogram. So the more density, the more chance there is to obscure or hide a breast cancer on the mammogram. So here's what an example of a teeny tiny breast cancer that would be very easy to see in a breast that is almost entirely fatty and probably a scattered breast density, but may be very easy to hide on a heterogeneously dense breast or an extremely dense breast. 10% of women have a pro uh, uh, almost entirely fatty breasts. About 40% of women have scattered density. 40%, another 40% of women have heterogeneously dense. Another 10% of women have extremely dense breasts. This is just a graphic of that same information. Most women are within the heterogeneously dense and scattered dense categories. Only 10% of women have extremely dense breasts. So does breast density increase your risk of breast cancer? Yes, unfortunately it does. People with high density breasts are four to six times more likely to get a breast cancer than the women with the least dense breast. It's because the density of that glandular tissue is what makes the breast cancers. Also having dense breasts, as we discussed, can make it harder to see the signs of cancer for the radiologist. What causes dense breasts? Well, it's just the natural makeup of your body. It can be affected by age and hormones. And sometimes we can see people become less dense over the, over the course of their life as they, as they age. Um, and people who have a, um, um, here, let's keep going. If there's anything that you can, is there anything you can do to decrease your breast density? Not really. Um, there's really no foods or supplements that will change your breast density. Actually, having a lower BMI or weighing less might actually increase the breast density. You have not very much fat in your body. You may not have very much fat in your breasts, which only leads that dense fibrous tissue on the mammogram. So what are the screening recommendations for people with very dense breasts? Well, we recommend you get a screening mammogram every year despite having the breast density and to discuss your risks with your doctor. You can discuss supplemental screening or extra screening with ultrasound or MRI based on your risk factors. In summary, mammograms save lives, screening saves lives, and we have a lot of different imaging tools at our disposal to help see if something is normal or abnormal. Density matters, but it's not everything. All right, I think we got through everything. Are there any questions? Thank you, Dr. Lowell. Uh, I think I will start with the questions in the chat. Uh, and I would invite all of the panelists to uh, jump in if you have any insight, especially about this first question. So are tattoos safe over scar if you have implants? Um, I'll take a crack at it, which I, I think that Tattoos as part of nipple areolar reconstruction is something that uh, is is safe and something that that is is widely done. Uh, I know our plastic surgeons at UNC have specific artists that they work with who understand the anatomy of the reconstruction uh, and are able to do the tattoos in a safe way. And I imagine that any tattoos that those people did would be safe. Um, I don't know of any data that other tattoos might be associated with higher infection risks or with problems, but if I, I would just be cautious about making sure that the tattoo artist understands the anatomy of the reconstruction and the concerns of the implants and whether or not that implant is on top of the muscle or below the muscle. So moving on, um, Jackie, I think the next two questions are probably both for you. So the first one is on prevention, do 30 minute walks count as aerobic activity? Short answer is yes. Um, and great news is that Dr. Champ is actually gonna be talking later this morning uh, regarding exercise um, as well. So there's an entire presentation on this uh, to answer in further depth. Okay. Uh, and is there a diet that's best for reducing recurrence? Um, in terms of recurrence, there's no specific um, diet per se. Certainly general health is important. Um, so minimizing saturated fats um, and having a well-balanced diet, lots of veggies, lots of fruits, um, but minimizing those uh, fats on the diet. Thank you. 
Uh, Dr. Lowell, uh, two questions about density. If I have dense breasts, would it be smart to have a screening mammogram and an ultrasound each year? And the second question, does high dense breast require annual tomosynthesis? So let me start with the first, does high dense breast require annual tomosynthesis? We certainly recommend annual screening mammography and most mammograms done nowadays, certainly all mam screening mammograms done at Duke, unless involved in a research study, are 3D mammograms. But I think if you do have dense breasts and you're at a different institution, requesting tomosynthesis mammography is, um, would be an, oh, I would recommend that in somebody who has dense breasts. And if you have dense breasts, um, it would be helpful to have supplemental screening, I think was the other question with ultrasound or MRI. I think that's a, a combination. I think that would be a, certainly continuing annual screening mammography would be recommended. And, but discussing your risk factors or so, uh, other risk factors with your doctor and discussing the pros and cons of supplemental screening. Because as I said in the talk, sometimes supplemental screening can have false alarms. Just like mammography, we can find some things that are not cancerous and may may never become cancerous, but we can sometimes find things that are benign, extra on ultrasound or MRI. And discussing that with your doctor before initiating it, I think is really, really important. And also just uh, I'm trying to decide if your breasts are indeed extremely dense or just heterogeneously dense, which can make a huge difference. I think there was one more question with scarred breast tissue, I think that's a really good question. If somebody with a history of granulomatous mastitis I saw in the chat, I think that's a really, really good question. I think scars, particularly from granulomatous mastitis, which can look like lots of different things on imaging and be extremely confusing on imaging. Granulomatous mastitis can look from everything from normal to it can look like very bad breast cancer. I think an MRI might be very helpful in a patient for um, supplemental screening and somebody with a history of granulomatous mastitis, particularly if they have had lots of surgeries. But again, that would be something very important to discuss with your doctor and the, it sounds like with multiple surgeries with your surgeon. Thank you. I'm hearing from Dr. Plicka that we're out of time. I want to thank uh, all <laughs> of our speakers today. You did a fantastic job uh, and I certainly learned a lot today. Thank you. Okay, everybody, uh, thank you to our first round of speakers and our moderator, it was a fantastic session. We're gonna take a five minute break. Uh, so we'll start just a couple minutes after 10 for our second session. And we'll see you back here uh, in that, at that time. See you in a few.
Okay. Good morning again, everyone. Thank you again for joining us for our sixth annual What's Best for Breast. For those of you just joining us, my name is Jennifer Plicta, and I'm the director of our high-risk clinic and a breast surgeon here at Duke. Uh, just a reminder of where we're at in today's uh, session. We already had our first education block. We're getting ready to start our second one, and then we will have another few-minute break. We'll have our third education block, and then there will be an opportunity to meet some additional groups. Uh, you'll see them listed here, including Invitae, our presenting sponsor for today's event, Commotion, uh, some breast surgeons, uh, Force, Caris, and our community outreach engagement equity team, and then BSEP. So the next session, we're going to be covering benign breast disease, breast cancer 101, breast reconstruction, and lymphedema. And our moderator for this session is our newly appointed chief of breast surgery at Duke, Dr. Maggie Denome, who is also a breast surgeon uh, in the Raleigh practice. Uh, so Dr. Denome, I'll let you take over. Super. Thank you so much. Um, welcome, everybody. It's been a great morning so far. What an excellent first educational session. I'm happy to moderate the second session. Our first speaker is Dr. Hannah Warax. She's one of our assistant professors in surgery. She's a fellowship trained breast surgeon who cares for our patients out at Lumberton, and she will be speaking to us about benign breast disease. Good morning, everyone. Let me see why it won't let me share my screen. Any ideas, Jan? Uh, are you clicking the green share screen at the bottom? I am, and it, it says that it won't allow Zoom to share my screen, but in my system preferences, it's clicked. So I'm not quite sure what else I can do. Okay, well, I'll share my screen and you can just direct me. Okay, give me Perfect. just a second here. Sorry about that. That's why I like to have a backup copy of the slides. Absolutely. All right, uh, let's see, share my PowerPoint. Okay, you can see my slides? Yes, ma'am. All Great. right, you just tell me when you want me to advance, okay? That's good. Good morning, everyone. We'll be going through a little bit of um, benign breast disease. Uh, it's actually a really, really broad topic. I um, mean, unfortunately, we don't have to, time to go over everything today, but we'll touch on some of the high points. Um, advance, please. Next slide. So some of the topics that we'll go over, we'll go over breast pain in general, um, breast cysts, breast infections, nipple discharge and certain things to look for, um, as well as fibroadenomas, which is a really common um, benign breast mass. Next slide. So breast pain. I think when patients come to see me, one of my very first questions um, is describe your pain. Tell me where it is. If you could take one finger um, and point, show me where the pain is. Uh, and most of the time, I feel like breast pain for our patients is usually um, either all encompassing of the breast or one specific place. But I will tell you frequently, I see patients and it's not the breast at all that's causing them pain. Um, we can have referred pain from our chest wall. So the muscles that live deep to our breast um, or the bones or their um, cartilage, as well as the shoulder or the arm. A lot of patients will have um, rotator cuff issues and come to us and think that it's breast pain or axillary pain or underarm pain. So um, teasing that out initially in the, in the visit is very important. The next question is whether it's a, oh, a cyclic pain or not. Um, if it's related to patient cycles, then sometimes it's related to hormones and a little bit easier for us to intervene on. Um, but it's the pain that's not necessarily related to our cycle that's a little bit more difficult to control. Um, and the treatment's usually fairly straightforward. A lot of times the breast is just not adequately supported. Um, and it's, it's always interesting to have a conversation with patients about the portions of our bra that actually support um, our breast themselves. Um, and then there are some other supplements or over-the-counter medications that we can use at times to help aid in decrease in pain for patients. Next slide. The next thing we'll talk about is breast cysts. And I know they talked a little bit about this in our last session, um, but 
breast cysts are actually fairly common. Um, a lot of times they're found on breast self-exam. A patient will come in and say, I feel this, can you look? Um, can we do an exam and tell me what you think it is? Um, and thankfully we have ultrasound in the clinic so we can look pretty quickly and show them if it's something um, related to this and it will look just like what Dr. Lowell showed you in, in the last um, session. Um, they can change in size. I have one patient who hers goes from being um, fairly small to over six centimeters, um, so over two and a half inches. So um, they can change pretty rapidly. They can be simple, so essentially one big cyst, one big fluid collection, um, or have tiny little pieces within the cyst that um, aren't as amenable to drainage if needed. Um, and people can have several within the breast as well. And depending on how the presentation is or how many there are, how complicated they are, um, sometimes we'll follow these or they can be aspirated if needed for patient comfort. Next slide. <clears throat> the next thing we'll talk about is breast infections. Um, two big categories for breast infections are mastitis and abscess. Um, and the presentation is fairly different. Um, Mastitis is inflammation of the breast tissue itself. Um, usually this is related to breastfeeding. It's actually fairly uncommon to see it outside of breastfeeding. Um, and usually it's only one side, although sometimes patients can have it on both sides. Um, usually we uh, control patients' pain um, or treat with antibiotics for mastitis. Abscess is fairly different. It's not just inflammation of the breast tissue. It's a collection within the breast that needs to be drained, um, either with aspiration, which is our, our usual treatment for that. But if aspiration fails, sometimes it needs to be um, in size to drain it. Um, it can be related to breastfeeding or it can be related to other factors. Smoking is a big cause of breast abscess um, and something that the patient can actually change to help mitigate their disease. Um, and we, these need to be followed. Abscesses can recur after they're drained. So usually we'll have the patients come back fairly soon for us to reevaluate the clinic. Next slide. The next thing we'll talk about is nipple discharge. Um, usually nipple discharge is not related to a cancer, although it can be related to cancer. Um, we'll ask lots of questions about the nipple discharge itself. What color is it? Is it clear? Is it something that you can elicit yourself when you try to express the discharge? Does it come out? Or is it something that you just happen to find on your clothing um, every so often that you've noticed? Um, in clinic, you'll notice if we're trying to express discharge, we'll pay attention to whether it's one specific duct or if it's several different ducts. Um, we'll also ask sometimes about the timing of it. Diagnostic imaging, just like Dr. Lowell went over, is usually necessary for us to determine the cause of nipple discharge um, and then determine how to best treat it. Next slide. We'll talk a little bit about fibroadenomas. So fibroadenomas are a benign uh, growth within the breast. Usually they're filled as a mass on uh, within the breast that the patient finds or something that we see on imaging if they're deep or small. Um, they're made up of um, the glandular portions of the breast um, or stromal tissue itself. Um, some patients can come in and have multiple of these. I have one patient who has over 10 fibroadenomas in one breast. They can vary in size. They can be fairly small um, and they can grow over time. A lot of times they grow during pregnancy as well. Um, these need biopsy sometimes to validate that they are truly just a fibroadenoma, just as Dr. Lowell showed you, they can look very similar at times to breast cancer. Um, so we usually biopsy them to tell the difference if we're not um, completely sure when we look at them on the imaging. Um, and then they can come out of the breast if they're uh, bothersome to the patient um, or if they're growing and growing at a fairly rapid pace um, or if there are other concerns um, such as the appearance of it or being able to follow it long term for a patient. Next slide. The next question is sort of what to do. Patients will say, well, what do I do if I have this disorder? Um, usually it's get in with a, a provider that can follow you long-term, um, be able to perform your clinical breast exams and to be able to teach you how to do your own self breast exams. Um, if you feel something in the breast, ask about it. Uh, I, most of my patients that have found their own um, process uh, have reassured themselves that it's it's nothing because most commonly it is nothing, but if you feel something, ask about it. Um, and then a mammogram when it's right for you. As we've talked about some today, everybody's timing for mammogram initially and for other imaging is not the same. So talk to your provider about when to best do that for you. 
So in summary, the breast has many benign conditions. Uh, pain, infection, nipple discharge, and masses are common. But if you feel something new or there's something newly discovered on your imaging, discuss it with your provider and figure out how to follow up to best manage it um, for you long term. All right, you guys, I'll give it back over to Dr. Denome. I hope you have a great rest of the day. Thank you, Dr. Warax. That was really a fabulous uh, overview. And I think it's really important to know that there are um, a lot of benign things that happen in the breast that uh, we can be reassured by. Uh, and our next uh, presenter is Dr. Susan McDuff. She's assistant professor in radiation oncology, and she's actually going to go over the nuts and bolts of breast cancer uh, in Breast Cancer 101. Thanks. Yeah, thanks so much for, for having me today. And I'm really excited to share with you some thoughts um, that I have about breast cancer basics. So the first question um, is really, what is breast cancer? Well, I think the easiest way to think about breast cancer is, or cancer in general, is that um, there are a group of cells when a, when a cancer develops, a group of cells that have developed the ability to grow when they're not supposed to. And a breast cancer is um, when a group of cells in the breast um, start to grow and invade or take over um, tissue that, that they're not supposed to be in. Um, so breast cancer, um, unfortunately, as um, you know, is uh, incredibly common. It's the most common form of non-skin cancer in women. Um, and in 2022, there are uh, going to be an estimated over 287,000 new invasive breast cancers diagnosed in the U.S. and an additional greater than 50,000 pre-invasive breast cancers. And we'll talk in just a minute about um, the difference between an invasive or a pre-invasive breast cancer. Um, and men can actually get breast cancer too. So there's going to be um, in 2022 over 2,700 uh, male breast cancers in the U.S. So I think the big thing I'd, I'd wanna express today is that breast cancer um, is, is very unique for each particular um, situation. Not all breast cancers are the same. And today we'll talk about how the stage, the grade, the biomarkers are all aspects that we look at and we'll get into this in more detail um, to help guide the treatment. So because not all breast cancers are the same, not all treatment courses are gonna be the same for each breast cancer. So often patients need surgery, sometimes they need chemotherapy, hormone therapy, um, or radiation. And um, I think because um, each, each situation is so unique and each um, person or patient is so unique, we really try to take into account values and preferences that, that patients come with um, when we're determining the best course of treatment for them. So the two big types of breast cancer, um, you can find a breast cancer when it's in a pre-invasive or a non-invasive state, or you can find a breast cancer when it um, has developed the ability to start to invade and try to take take um, over tissues that, it, that it's not supposed to be in. So uh, pre-invasive breast cancers are those that are found when the cancer cells are completely confined um, to the duct or, or area that they started in. So um, these, these situations are stage zero breast cancers. And, um, and if, um, if left untreated, although there's, there's um, ongoing research in this area, um, these cells can start to develop the ability to grow and invade beyond um, the duct itself into the surrounding breast tissue. So when we think about the treatment for breast cancer, well, the first big um, thing we think about is the staging. And we use the TNM staging system to stage breast cancers. Um, and this really um, uh, helps us understand how big the tumor is, where the tumor is, and, and this helps us um, make the best um, treatment approach for, for each patient. So the T in the TNM staging is for tumor. Um, a non-invasive tumor will have a TIS classification, or um, this is a ductal carcinoma in situ. And invasive tumors, when they've um, pushed beyond the duct, will um, have a, a one to four classification related to the size of the tumor, whether there's involvement of skin um, or uh, chest wall or muscle. And the next thing we think about is whether the cancer has spread to the local lymph nodes. And we assess this um, clinically when we meet someone in, in clinic, how, how the lymph nodes feel, how they look on scans, whether they've been biopsied and the results of those biopsies. Um, and then after surgery, we look at the pathologic um, lymph node status for the number and location of any involved lymph nodes. And M in this um, staging, um, a scheme stands for a metastasis. And this refers to when breast cancer cells um, have um, started to grow somewhere else in the body outside where they started in the breast um, and, and local regional lymph nodes. 
So the next thing we think about when we um, find a new breast cancer is um, what it looks like under the microscope and um, the histology in grade help us think about the treatment for breast cancer as well. So um, histology refers to what type of breast cancer is this? And when um, we do a biopsy, we take the, the cells from the tissue and look at them under, the, under a microscope here. And our amazing pathologist can help determine um, how aggressive these cells look. So low grade cells um, look to be growing a little less quickly compared to high grade or more aggressive looking cells. And the last thing I think that's really important for us to understand when we have a patient with a new breast cancer is the, the biomarker status. And we look at estrogen receptor status, progesterone receptor status, and HER2 status. And these are um, going to help us, um, these are aspects of the, the breast cancer cells that really help us guide treatment. So um, for many women, um, breast cancer cells are going to be hormone responsive and that can help us determine the best treatment for, for this. And it also helps us think about the most appropriate systemic or whole body treatment options. So when we talk about breast cancer treatment, um, we, I, I think it's really helpful to think about treatments in terms of local treatments, those that are designed to get rid of the cancer in the breast um, or the surrounding lymph nodes and um, systemic or whole body treatment. So as far as local treatments, we um, can do surgery to the breast. Our, our amazing breast surgeons um, can do um, in many situations, either um, a lumpectomy often, if it's just one um, tumor in one part of the breast or sometimes mastectomy is, is needed or recommended. And it's also really important to understand if um, the cancer cells have spread to um, lymph nodes in the axilla. So um, sometimes we need to um, uh, do a more complete or um, uh, extensive axillary lymph node dissection to remove more lymph, lymph nodes, but often we're able to do a sentinel lymph node biopsy, which helps um, our, our surgeons find the first one to three lymph nodes that are draining from the breast and um, to see whether those are involved. And radiation is another treatment that's that's local that, that my colleagues and I offer in situations where um, we need to kill any tiny little cancer cells that might be left behind um, in either the breast or the, the um, chest wall and lymph nodes um, after surgery. And we'll talk about those in, in just a minute. And so this is um, in contrast again, so um, uh, surgical oncology and radiation oncology are really local regional therapies and um, medical, our medical oncology colleagues really talk about systemic or whole body therapies. Um, as I mentioned, sometimes endocrine therapy is important. Um, and we'll go through each of these targeted therapy, chemotherapy, and now immunoth immunotherapy is playing a bigger role. So surgery, I think this is a really um, nice picture to illustrate what's involved with a lumpectomy. So taking out the um, tumor itself and a small um, rim of normal tissue, but leaving the rest of the breast intact. Um, and this is in contrast to a mastectomy where um, our surgeons may need to remove the, the entire breast tissue um, and, um, and either um, it can be left as um, a flat chest wall or, or their reconstruction options, which we'll um, hear about next. Um, so radiation is another, as I mentioned, local treatment for breast cancer, and um, radiation is something that we give with a, a machine called a linear accelerator, and we're using for radiation high-energy x-rays targeted to the tissue that we think has a very high chance of cancer cells that are, that are left behind, and we use radiation to get rid of those. Um, so when we design a radiation plan, my colleagues and I design a very specific unique plan for each particular patient, their body and their breast cancer. And we can make any shape of radiation that we want from the head of the machine here, and we can angle it from any direction that we want. So this is an illustration of a, a woman who's getting um, radiation after her lumpectomy to the left breast. Um, she, um, you can't actually see radiation, but for the purpose of this picture, I really like that it's being shown as a red ray of light so that if you could look inside the body, you're seeing that the treatment is going just to the breast and leaving um, the heart and lungs alone. We have, um, as this is on the left, we have lots of um, techniques for help protecting the heart, including breath holds, but um, don't, don't have too much time to talk about that today. So, <laughs> um, so systemic therapy for breast cancer. So these again are, are whole body treatments. As I mentioned, sometimes endocrine therapy um, is useful where um, uh, the, these are hormone therapies that help block estrogen and progesterone from helping breast cancers uh, cells grow. And these can be either in terms of a medication or ovarian suppression or um, a surgery to remove the ovaries. And those are um, 
options for that. So sometimes chemotherapy is needed to help cure um, a breast cancer. This is um, often given for uh, patients with HER2 positive cancers, triple negative cancers, or patients with significant node, nodal disease. And um, for women that have a hormone receptor positive or HER2 negative breast cancer, um, there, there are tests such as the Oncotype test or the Mammoprint test that can help us determine which of those patients may benefit from chemo. There's also targeted therapies such as Herceptin that are really important for HER2 positive breast cancers. And now immunotherapy is playing a bigger role, um, uh, particularly for triple negative breast cancers in helping the immune system um, fight breast cancer. So to summarize, breast cancer unfortunately is very common, but the majority of situations are curable. Um, and each breast cancer is really different as every patient and, and person is different. So every treatment course is going to be unique. Um, treatment will depend on the features of the breast cancer, size, location, biomarker status, um, but also patient preferences and values. And so if you are a loved or a loved one is diagnosed with breast cancer, please don't be afraid to express um, what you're hoping for, what you're worried about, and please don't be afraid to um, ask questions at every step of the way. We would um, take, be with you every step of the way to answer these questions and, and make you comfortable and develop the best plan for you. So thanks for having me today and I'm happy to chat um, in the Q&A and also um, happy to take any questions by email or, um, or office, my office number. Thanks, Dr. McDuff. That was a, a wonderful summary of a very complicated topic. And I think the good news is that we do have ways of personalizing breast cancer care based on your specific tumor type. And um, I think that's the good news going forward. So our next speaker will be Dr. Rebecca Nagsted. She will be speaking on breast reconstruction. She's an assistant professor in the um, plastic and reconstructive surgery um, division, but she also has a specialty and interest in lymphatic surgery. So she's going to speak to us on breast reconstruction. Thank you. I think you're still muted. All right, hopefully you can hear me now. Yep. All right, thank you. So I'm delighted to be here today and talk about breast reconstruction. So why have breast reconstruction? So it can restore form after cancer surgery, whether it's a lumpectomy or a mastectomy. And it's been shown for women who pursue breast reconstruction that it actually improves their health-related quality of life in the long term. However, it's a very, very individualized decision. You have many different options for breast reconstruction, and that's what we'll talk about today. So there's a few options and in broad strokes, when you're getting reconstruction, your main options are having no reconstruction. And this is what we call going flats. The second would be implant-based reconstruction. And the third is called autologous tissue reconstruction. And this is when we use your own tissue from various parts of your body to create new breasts. The important thing to know is that it's never too late to get reconstruction, and you can also change your mind about what type of reconstruction you ultimately would like to have. So the first option is going flat. You can either be completely flat, and this is just the incision is closed after a mastectomy, or if you have some excess tissue, we can actually just rearrange the tissue that's left to create a small breast mound. The second option, implant-based reconstruction, we often use something called a tissue expander at the time of mastectomy. And I have a slide showing what a tissue expander looks like. For some patients, based on your cancer characteristics and your patient characteristics, you can have a implant placed at the time of mastectomy. This is called direct to implants, and the final implant is placed at the time of mastectomy. The decision of what type of reconstruction to pursue, tissue expander or direct implant, is largely based on your characteristics as well as the cancer characteristics and the plan for any treatment that might have to occur after a mastectomy. So this picture in the upper right corner is what a tissue expander looks like. It's a temporary implant that's placed at the time of mastectomy and it's slightly inflated at the time of surgery. We start expanding the tissue expander in clinic two weeks after the mastectomy, and we continue expanding it about every two weeks or so until you decide that you are happy with the size that we have been able to achieve. When that expansion is complete, we can then exchange for a permanent implant at a second surgery. 
Once you have a tissue expander, there's no rush to do the expansion and there's no rush to do the tissue expander to implant change. So it is very flexible and it's based on your schedule and availability. So this is what a tissue expander looks like. This is a side view. We're looking at a woman from the side on and you can see that her breast has been removed and there is a tissue expander in place. There's a little port that we can find. This is not visible on the skin. We find it with a magnet and then we inject the saline by accessing the port. It's very, very well tolerated since you're numb for a while after a mastectomy. And like I said, we can do it about every two weeks after the mastectomy occurs. So autologous tissue, autologous auto means using your own tissue. The most commonly used tissue is abdominal tissue. We can use other tissue though. We can use excess tissue from the thigh region, from the buttock or other areas of your body. It can be done at the time of the mastectomy or at a later date. Most commonly, if you are planning on having autologous reconstruction, we will plate a, a tissue expander at the time of the mastectomy, and then down the road, when it's a time convenient for you, we will plan on doing the autologous reconstruction. So the most commonly used flap is called a deep flap, and that's a name just based on the anatomy. And what this picture is showing is, this is a woman who's already have a mastectomy. You can see her right breast has been removed. And this is the incision that is used for a deep flap. And it, it's hard to see, but what this is showing is that the fat is reflected back and then underlying it, this is your rectus muscle. This is your six pack muscle. So we dig out the artery and the vein that are supplying the fat. And that's what this is showing. So there's the fat and then there's the artery and the vein that are supplying it, keeping it alive. And then after that, it's basically a plumbing operation. We get to some blood vessels in the chest and we hook up the plumbing, and then that allows your abdomen tissue to serve as a new breast. Since it is made up of fat, it does change with you. So if you gain weight, your breast will likely increase. If you lose weight, your breast will likely decrease. And it ages very naturally with you, just like a, uh, your breast would. This is a very busy slide, but this is the pros and cons of implants versus autologous tissue. When I have the conversations with patients of whether or not we're gonna pursue implant or autologous reconstruction, it's a very, very long visit. We spend at least an hour together talking about options. And it's always a really great idea to bring someone with you to the visit because it's a lot of information to hear. And it's really great to have a second set of ears and someone to take notes and help ask questions. So in general, an implant reconstruction is a shorter surgery, it's uh, an outpatient procedure or one night in the hospital, and it's a quicker recovery. Because you're only doing surgery on the breast and not the abdomen or a second site, it does have decreased pain. There's no other scars, there's no abdomen scars. The pro or con, depending on how you look at it, is they feel like implants, whereas the autologous tissue feels more like a breast because it's made of fat tissue. It can be difficult to achieve symmetry if you're only going having one-sided mastectomy with an implant. If you have an implant, there's no changes in your breast if you gain weight or lose weight. There are certain risks that are only related to an implant, and these are things that we extensively talk about in clinic, but things like an implant rupture, capsular contracture, infection of the implant, or displacement of the implant. If you require radiation after your mastectomy, there is an increased risk of uh, complications with implant-based reconstruction, and often for these individuals, we will recommend that they have the autologous or self-tissue reconstruction. Having an implant is kind of like having a car. About every 10 years or so, you have to take it in for maintenance. So with an implant, about every 10 years or so, you have to go in, change the implant out, do a little bit of work to clean up the breast tissue. So it's something that you should think in your head. About every 10 years, you will require surgery. With an implant, we can achieve about the same size as your preoperative breast versus the autologous tissue, we can typically achieve a larger breast based on how much abdominal tissue you have. Most women have at least one revision surgery after implants or flaps. This can be to adjust the implant, change the size. We can create a nipple areola. We can do fat grafting, which is where we take fat from your abdomen and inject it around the breast to provide more volume. 
So who is a candidate for breast reconstruction? Not everyone is a candidate for breast reconstruction. Each plastic surgeon has individual criteria, but these, these are my criteria and they're pretty common for most plastic surgeons. So BMI has to be under 35. You have to be a non-smoker or quit for at least six weeks before and after your reconstruction. You have to desire reconstruction and have realistic goals, which we will talk about when you uh, have your clinic visits. So there will be an excellent talk after my talk about lymphedema, but just in brief, I wanted to introduce the concept of lymphatic reconstruction. So lymphedema is a swelling of the limb that usually occurs after nodes are taken for cancer. There's an increased risk of getting lymphedema if you have postoperative radiation. Relatively new in this country is the opportunity to do surgeries to repair the lymphatic system. And this is something that I specialize in. Um, so this is something that we'll hear a talk about later. And you should know that if you develop lymphedema, there are options for restoring the lymphatic system. So when you're thinking about breast reconstruction, these are some questions to ask yourself. How important is rebuilding your breast to you? Would you prefer just to have a breast prosthetic that you can take on and off? Do you wanna to wait to have reconstruction? Do you think that breast reconstruction will help you feel whole after your mastectomy? Are you okay with having more than one surgery? Do you prefer implants or flaps? And how do you feel about the required recovery for each option? So in summary, breast reconstruction is a very individualized decision. Importantly, it's, uh, it's never too late to get breast reconstruction and not everyone is a candidate for breast reconstruction. I think it's incredibly important that you choose a reconstructive surgeon with whom you're comfortable because we will spend a lot of time together for years working with breast reconstruction. And very, very importantly, ask questions. There's a ton of information for breast reconstruction. So you should find a surgeon whom you're comfortable with and who you feel comfortable asking questions because it's really a decision that only you can make. So thank you very much. I'll hand it back to Dr. Nomi and I'll be happy to answer any questions at the end. Thank you, Dr. Nackstead. An excellent overview of breast reconstruction. And it's great. I mean, we've had three great uh, topics presented by experts in their field and they all stay exactly on time, which is amazing. So we're gonna hear next from uh, Dr. Kendra Parrish. She is actually our current surgical breast oncology fellow. She um, comes to us after several years as a general surgeon in Lumberton, and she's specializing in, in breast cancer now. So she's going to speak to us on lymphedema. Okay, good morning, everyone, um, or afternoon, whatever it is. It's, it's good to be here. And as Dr. Nagstead said, she is an expert in lymphedema. So I'm going to be talking about this, but certainly for questions, I'm happy to address them. And she can as well, because she really um, knows, knows her stuff about this. So what is, oh, hold on. Try to do that again. All right, what is lymphedema? It is um, swelling either the breast or the arm. So a lot of people just think about the arm, but certainly it can happen in the breast as well. And, and we're really talking about kind of on that treatment side or the cancer or affected side. It can happen at a range of times. Sometimes it can happen before surgery. So, and that's preoperative or before surgery. If somebody has advanced cancer and it has already moved from the breast into the lymph nodes, there is a possibility that that can cause some of these lymph channels to block and cause swelling in the arm. However, usually if it's going to happen and it doesn't happen to everyone, it would happen after surgery. On typical, it'd be about a year to two years after surgery, um, but unfortunately it, it is a lifetime risk of, of lymph node surgery and, and breast cancer surgery. For diagnosis, so there are some things that are subjective or what the patient or, you know, I would feel. So if it happened to me, I might have tingling or just tightness in my arm. Um, I'd be at a higher chance of skin infections and swelling. And the, this isn't directly after surgery because certainly directly after surgery, you can have some tingling or numbness in the, the breast as well as the arm. So this is a little bit later that you would start to feel these things. 
this picture is just representing um, different measurements that we may take, and there's different ways to measure lymphedema. Uh, certainly a common one is to measure different points of the arm. As you can see, you can't just measure one point of the arm. It has to be multiple. And, and it can be really helpful to measure before surgery as well, because as many things in our body aren't completely symmetric, certainly if we're, if we're measuring one arm versus the other, even before surgery, not having any issues, you may have a difference in size. So it can be helpful to measure at both times. This is um, a picture showing kind of there's different stages. So this first picture is showing that the patient, you know, came in to her doctor and said, I have maybe some of that numbness or tingling, but that you wouldn't be able to see anything just by looking at the arms. The next one, and you can see it's a patient's left arm, but our, you know, when we're looking at it on the right, that this arm, there's swelling, but with, you know, compression, so a sleeve or a wrap or just elevating the arm, it goes away. This next stage is when it doesn't go away by some of these other techniques. And then, and then you get to this really severe um, kind of stage that is very difficult to treat. And just because you have stage one does not mean that you have to progress to stage four. This is just kind of representative of what would happen at different stages, but not that you would have to um, progress to that. So some other risk factors, the biggest, and some of these were mentioned, but certainly obesity, that's a huge risk factor. So BMI over 30, any type of node biopsy. So if it's a sentinel node biopsy, where just maybe one to three nodes are removed, that is still a risk. It's a much lower risk as compared to having an axillary lymph node dissection. That's when um, level two and level one. So some of the, the, the significant amount of lymph nodes in the armpit have to be removed. So the more nodes removed, um, the higher the chance. Also radiation. So again, you can have lymphedema of the breast. And so um, radiation to the breast or the armpit, the axilla does uh, increase that risk. So does certain type of chemotherapies as well as arm trauma or infections. So if you're in a car accident and break your arm, maybe on that side, you do have a, a higher risk. Again, though, um, just because you have these risks does not inherently mean that you're going to have lymphedema. It is just thinking about it. So some of the things that we often tell patients as medical people not to do that are not really great documented are things like IVs. So no, normally you'd hear a patient say, right, I've had breast cancer on the right. I can't have a blood, my blood pressure checked. I can't get any blood draws, anything like that on the right. That's not completely true. Um, certainly there's nothing wrong with trying to preserve that arm and getting things on the opposite side, but you don't have to panic about it. So if you need your blood pressure checked, it's fine. If you need you know, an IV line, um, anything like that, it's fine. Same thing with lifting and movement. Movement of the arm is actually very important. Some of the other ideas, um, and this is a risk factor of that we don't exactly know why some people get lymphedema. Maybe they don't have any of the known risk factors, but there can be some inflammatory issue kind of in that person and can lead to it. As Dr. Nagstad also alluded to, there are some different techniques operatively or surgically that can be done to um, try to decrease the risk, especially in somebody who's BMI might be elevated, or they know they're going to need all those lymph nodes in the armpit removed to try to prevent it from happening rather than chase our tail later. And um, one of them is uh, reverse axillary mapping. So there's dye. This is the armpit that we're looking at. And there's dye injected. This is at the time of surgery so that we can see any of the lymphatics that are coming up from the arm and try to not disrupt them so that we can still do what we need to do in the armpit and the lymph nodes draining the breast, but try to not disrupt those ones from the arm. Um, also, oh, excuse me. Also the really a big key, and I'll repeat this, is treating it as soon as someone notices it. So if you start to notice that numbness or tingling or something different in your breast or your arm, it's really important to, to tell somebody about that. So treatment, there are um, <sighs> combined congestive therapies that are as this 
person in the in the um, picture showing kind of massage. So there's different type of occupational and physical therapy things to try to encourage all that flow back to our body and not staying out in the arm. Um, strength training, although not you know not lifting a thousand pounds, but low weights can actually be low um, low poundage can be helpful and really kind of babying that skin and making sure that trying to prevent any infections. Then also is some of these lymphovenous anastomoses. So trying to, if we disrupt any of the lymphatics in the armpit, trying to give them a drainage outlet to one of the veins instead of not being able to drain somewhere. So what, what does it matter? Some of it is just the way our mechanics and our body movement. So certainly um, the picture of the lady with the stage four, it's really disabling and you have a much higher risk of cellulitis in that arm. And that leads to hospitalizations leading to days off work. So those are, you know, and the way that we're looking at our bodies, uh, those are important things. And really it should be part of, you know, we talk about survivorship plans and maybe chemotherapy regimens or endocrine therapy, radiation, lymphedema prevention and um, connecting with physical therapy or occupational therapy should really be a part of that just to be aware of. So really um, in summary, it can occur, the lymphedema can occur in the arm or the breast. It does not occur to everyone but there are some of the risk factors, as we mentioned, some of the, the key is prevention, but treatment early. And if something feels odd and you're not sure, and you think, oh, well, it doesn't look like anything. That's okay. That is exactly the time to mention it to the surgeon, to mention it to the oncologist, to mention it to somebody who can get you hooked up to, um, to try to treat that. You love that. that looks Thank you. Like a trash can. No, I have that too. What is, <laughs> thank you, Dr. Parrish. <laughs> sure. Oh, something about a trash can. Yeah. <laughs> so we have about 10 minutes um, for questions. So I am going to ask uh, some of the panelists to answer some questions. The, the first question from a patient is, why does breast cancer recur um, at distant sites? Could cancer cells be there when first diagnosed, just waiting to become active years later? And I'm going to address that one to Dr. McDuff. Thanks. Yeah, I think um, I think that's a very um, that's a very good question, um, and I think there's there is some debate um, for for this. So so when a, a breast cancer is an invasive breast cancer, it really does have the potential to spread either in the lymphatic system or um, in the bloodstream, and I think that the um, um, the thought though is that the the cancer cells normally uh, progress locally first. Um, but I, I think there, there is some controversy whether there may be dormant cancer cells um, at the time of an initial diagnosis. But I think that's why um, the systemic therapies are so important um, initially. Okay, thank you. Um, and this one will be doc for Dr. Warax. Can long-term inflammation um, increase risk for breast cancer development to specifically if someone has a history of granulomatous mastitis? I think that's an excellent question. You know, we don't have data that supports um, people having an increased risk of developing breast cancer if they have granulomas mastitis. Um, there are several cases of concurrent diagnosis of um, breast cancer in patients that have had granulomatous mastitis, but not a direct link that we know about. Um, we do have other diseases that we know chronic inflammation causes cancer later in life. So um, the most important thing I think for those patients is for them to have a discussion with their provider about the type of imaging that they need um, and when they need that specific imaging. Um, everybody's individual um, imaging plan is different, but especially when you have something like this. Okay, this one will be for Dr. Parrish and or Dr. Nagstead. It uh, is regarding insurance coverage for some of the surgical treatments for lymphedema. Is it covered by insurance? Is it considered cosmetic? Where are we at with this? You need to unmute. <laughs> um, 
So there is actually pretty good success at getting these covered by insurance. It's very dependent on what insurance carrier you have, um, but it's something that we submit to insurance. And if it is denied, we can do reviews with the insurance company to express to them about why it is important to get it covered. Um, if it's not covered, we still can do uh, cosmetic and some people will pay out of pocket for it. But by and large, we have pretty good success at getting these covered by insurance. And just most people, you would know about it ahead of time. So it certainly wouldn't be something that would be a surprise later for, you know, billing as well. It would be before surgery so that you guys would know about it. And there was a question to Dr. Nags that that was answered offline, but I wondered if others might find that uh, answer helpful as well. It was about, is there um, a minimum BMI for autologous reconstruction? And is it still an option for smaller smaller women? Yes, that's a really good question. So there's really not a lower limit of BMI that we can do autologous tissue reconstruction in. It just depends on where you hold your tissue. So some women hold excess tissue in their stomach versus their thighs versus their buttocks. And then also just how large you want your reconstructive breasts to be. So if you are a thin woman, we can still do autologous reconstruction. It's just that the, your ultimate reconstruction would be smaller breasts. Okay, I think we have also a few more minutes. So um, just a question that was asked previously, this one I'll direct to Dr. Warax. Um, is when you have a benign condition, can any of these benign conditions that you talked about, cysts, fibroadenomas, can they become cancer in the future? Uh, you, usually not. Um, Dr. Um, Rosenberger, who you hear from a little bit later, um, is a resident expert on something called um, a phyloides tumor. Um, and that's one of the few things that ha can have both a benign and a malignant presentation. But um, for the main, um, to answer your question broadly, most of the things that we discussed this morning will not um, transform into a malignancy. Um, if there's something suspicious about um, a benign lesion, then it is excised, uh, for example, um, there are things that can have a, about a two or 3% risk of um, upgrade to a malignant diagnosis after excision, but um, usually there'll, there'll be some telltale signs on the imaging um, or about the lesion that will make um, you and your provider consider excision um, rather than surveillance. But excellent question, and also something to bring up with your provider about what's reassuring about something if you're watching it. Anybody else have any questions they want to add to the chat? We still have about another five minutes. Otherwise, Dr. Nagstat, can you um, answer for everybody online? Why is there a benefit to going putting your implant over the muscle or under the muscle? I know there's a lot of changes uh, going on in that regard. Yeah, that's a great question, Dr. Denome. So. Um... We call that above the muscle or below the muscle prepectoral or subpectoral. So those are words that you might hear your reconstructive surgeon say. So prepectoral means above the muscle. Um, this is a relatively new technique. It's been around for about 10 years or so. Um, it's exclusively what I do. I very rarely do subpectoral. And the reason is, is that if you put the implant over the muscle, you don't have to violate the muscle. So it's uh, associated with less pain. It's a quicker recovery because of that. And also when you have the muscle over the implant, you can see the muscle if you flex your muscle. So just like you flex your chest muscle, you can see the muscle flexing over the implant and especially thin fit women really didn't like that. Um, so subpector reconstruction is still a really great option and every plastic surgeon practices differently, but it's definitely something that you should ask your plastic surgeon about where they'll be placing the tissue expander or implant and why. Thank you. Um, we got a couple more questions coming in. This one will be for Dr. McDuff. Should a patient with atypia be followed by oncology? Yeah, so um, if, if there's been a biopsy that shows um, atypical cells like atypical ductal hyperplasia, generally um, we'd want you to meet with a surgical oncologist and um, often those the recommendation is to completely remove the abnormality because they can be associated with either a pre-invasive or an invasive breast cancer. So I, I think that's, that's important um, to, to come in and see um, a surgeon. 
that long-term follow-up if they were just diagnosed with atypia with no cancer? Ah, great question. I think they the, they should continue to have their um, annual mammograms and um, and breast exams. And then Dr. McDuff, can you answer why if a patient chooses a mastectomy, they may still need chemotherapy or systemic therapy? Yeah, yeah. So the the kind of breast cancer is a little bit related to the the question earlier. It's um, breast cancers can have a different potential for trying to spread to a different part of the body. So especially um, triple negative biology, HER2 positive, or or um, more um, aggressive hormone receptor HER2 um, negative breast cancers can benefit from from chemotherapy to to make sure that any tiny little cancer cell that might have started to try to circulate in the bloodstream can be taken care of. Um, question for not, uh, Dr. Parrish, um, at what point can you have lymphatic repair? Must it be early? No, it doesn't have to be early. I mean, certainly the ideal would be an earlier situation than a later, but um, there are people with kind of that stage four that the arm is really disfigured and fibrotic that it can still be repaired. It's going to take longer. So oftentimes it'll start with um, liposuction of the arm to get rid of some of that really thick, dense fibrotic tissue. And then um, at an interval up to a year later, kind of the reconstruction or um, lymph nodes that are actually implanted at different locations in the arm to try to encourage all that flow out of, you know, the lymphatic fluid out of the arm and into the, the rest of the body. So it can be at various stages. And last question that's here, this is to Dr. Naxted. Does the type of cancer predict the chance of recurring in silicone? So I guess in an implant, do you have a risk of cancer recurring in an implant? Sorry, I keep forgetting to unmute myself. So all of the best literature we have suggests that having reconstruction of any form does not impact your chance of having a cancer recurrence, nor does it impact the ability to detect a cancer recurrence. Um, within implants, there's silicone and saline-based implants. Both are extremely safe and both are very good options for breast reconstruction. Okay, well, thank you, everybody. I'm going to turn it back to Dr. Plicta. I think this ends the second session. Yeah, I think it was another marvelous session. I thank everybody on the second uh, panel to, for being here today, Dr. Denome for moderating. Uh, we're going to take a five-minute break, and we will get started with our third and final session at 11 o'clock, probably right on the dot. So we'll see you back here then.
Okay, uh, good morning again for the third time, although we're approaching the afternoon quickly. For those of you just joining us, uh, welcome to the sixth annual What's Best for Breast uh, conversation with clinicians. Uh, I'm today's host. My name is Jennifer Plicta. I'm the director of our high risk clinic and a breast surgeon here at Duke. Uh, this is where we are in the agenda today. We're in our final educational block, but of course there will be a more information panel held right after this. And that will include uh, representatives from Invite, Commotion, the Duke Breast Surgery Team, FORCE, Caris, and the Community Outreach Engagement Equity Team, and then BSEP. The topics we're gonna cover in today's session are gonna be survivorship, exercise and breast cancer, local resources and access, and some breast cancer research. The moderator for our third and final uh, session is going to be Dr. Laura Rosenberger, who is an associate professor of surgery and a breast surgical oncologist. She has a high volume breast practice and enjoys both the counseling of women and the educating of surgical trainees. She studies rare breast tumors and has a few research trials open for women with phylloides tumors. And with that, I'm going to turn it over to Dr. Rosenberger. Thank you, Dr. Plicta. It's really great to be here with everyone today, and I'm looking forward to this next session. We have some uh, great speakers lined up, and so we'll jump right in. Our first speaker will be Dr. Kelly Westbrook. It's really my pleasure to introduce her. She's one of our outstanding medical oncologists here in our breast program and has a particular interest in women's sexual health, and she runs the sexual health program for survivors of women's cancers here at the Duke Cancer Institute. So Dr. Westbrook, I'll turn it over to you. And I think you're still muted, Kelly. And there we no go. No problem. There you go. <laughs> yep, I was having my own uh, technical difficulties, technical difficulties this morning myself. Yes. Thank you okay. very much. Um, well, thanks so much for that introduction. I'm honored to get to talk today about uh, survivorship. And I'll, I'll just start by admitting that the term survivor can be a loaded term in the cancer community. Um, in the breast cancer culture, it's thought to define women who have had an emotional or physical trauma. And while that's not inaccurate, because a cancer diagnosis can be very traumatic, um, many people feel the word itself puts the focus on the trauma rather than on the healing that comes afterwards. So some people prefer alternative terms such as alivers, thrivers, which emphasizes living as well as possible. So acknowledging that, um, I just want to say that this term survivorship really is a focus on that period of living well. So we're going to use the term survivorship for lack of a better word. The American Cancer Society uses the term survivorship to refer to anyone who has ever been diagnosed with cancer, no matter where they are in the course of their disease. And the National Cancer Institute considers a person to be a survivor from the time of diagnosis of their cancer through the balance of the rest of their life. And that is specifically to include all persons who are living with cancer. We do know that since one in eight women will be diagnosed with breast cancer in their lifetime, as we've already talked about this morning, um, and that because the vast majority of those women will go on to live the rest of their lives without a breast cancer recurrence, there are many women today who are living with breast cancer or a history of breast cancer. So even if the terms might be less than optimal, uh, the healthcare reality is that because we have better treatments, earlier detection, and ongoing advances in breast cancer care, we have more and more people living beyond that diagnosis. This graph just illustrates how much of an exponential increase in the number of cancer survivors uh, there have been in the U.S. So we've gone from about 3.6 million cancer survivors in the mid-70s to currently having almost 20 million cancer survivors. And it's estimated that by 2040, we'll have over 26 million cancer survivors allow, alive in the US. And when we break that down by disease group, you can see from this bar graph, if you squint, squint really carefully, that the vast majority of those cancer survivors are breast cancer survivors. So more than double the type of any other tumor type are our breast cancer survivors. 
So when we think about this term survivorship, there are multiple different definitions. Um, and while the definition may vary based on the different regulatory body, um, it's really the medical attempt to classify the care of patients and their supportive teams after a cancer diagnosis. The first quote up here is by Dr. Fitzhugh Mulan, who was diagnosed with cancer in the 70s as a young physician uh, when the statistics were not as good as they are today. And he founded the National Coalition for Cancer Survivorship because as both a physician and a patient, it seemed as if all the focus was on the diagnosis and the acute treatment. There are thought to be three phases of survivorship care. So acute survivorship is the period right after diagnosis when the treatment of the cancer is the focus. And this is a very active period where there are lots of appointments and you're coming, people are coming in. Um, it's very clear where, where they need to be and what they need to be doing. Extended survivorship involves the months after active treatment is over, but the effects of the cancer diagnosis and treatment are still significant. And then permanent survivorship refers to the time when years have passed since cancer diagnosis and treatment have been completed and the late effects may persist. So treatment of those long-term effects of cancer are the focus in this phase. It probably goes without saying, but there are many medical downstream effects of cancer diagnosis and treatment. And we've already talked about a few of those today, particularly with the excellent talk on lymphedema and, and radiation side effects. Um, many, many significant complications. And I really like how this pictorial representation shows some of those. Um, as I mentioned a bit before, there are many patients who report that that active phase of treatment while physically demanding is in some sense a bit easier because it's so well-defined. There are many appointments, there's more direction about what medication to take. Um, and in general, it's reported that there's less preparation for what to do when the appointments decrease or the treatments stop. And this quote on the right of the screen here was another physician cancer survivor who really felt alone at the point that she was discharged to survivorship care. In response to this, the Institute of Medicine came up with some guidelines for what survivorship care should entail. There should be a focus on prevention of recurrent and new cancers and side effects. There should be surveillance for cancer recurrence or spread. There should be assessment of medical and psychological late effects. There should be a focus on intervention for those late effects. And then there should also be coordination between all the members of a person's care team. So coordinating physicians can be a little bit like herding cats. Everyone is busy and there are a lot of moving pieces. I really like this graphic because it's a good pictorial representation of how complicated coordination of care for just one person can be. This is one of the things that's been somewhat facilitated by the electronic medical record, which allows us to communicate more effectively with people that we don't necessarily see in person. It's absolutely a work in progress. Um, I do feel it's a particular strength of our group. We have a lot of people and we try hard to connect, to connect the dots for each individual patient. But it's certainly something that's difficult and very important. Um, at the center of this graph is absolutely the patient and that's what's the most important. Um, and I do like to look at this and be reminded that, that patients are their own best advocates. And I feel that care is often uh, the most successful when patients work to help coordinate this care. Um, oh, I went too fast. This coordination is so important because of the long list of potential late side effects from breast cancer treatment. 
So you can see here that this list is long and there are multiple potential side effects from each discipline. Every type of treatment that we deliver for breast cancer has the potential to cause several different side effects and some of those can be long lasting. So every breast cancer patient, no matter which of the possible interventions they had deserves a focus on the potential physical effects of their diagnosis and treatment. And what you can probably also notice on this slide is there, that there is not a significant focus on the mental and emotional side effects that are possible from each of these interventions. When breast cancers are surveyed for their top concerns, the mental and emotional side effects of a cancer diagnosis are almost always at the very top. So these results came from a survey that was given to patients five to 10 years out from diagnosis. It was administered by the Livestrong Cancer Foundation. And you can see that despite the passage of a significant amount of time, the majority of patients were still experiencing some side effects from their breast cancer diagnosis and treatment. And that's why this component of survivorship or this focus on survivorship is so extremely important. It's an attempt to weave together all of the care for these long lasting side effects from cancer, cancer therapy. We as members of the care team are always asking ourselves how we can improve on these symptoms. And we are trying to turn the tide of survivorship from research into one that is classifying the problem towards interventions that are focused on improving wellness in this space. I'm not gonna spend much time here because uh, our next talk is Dr. Champ, who will really focus on exercise as an intervention in the survivorship space. But studies have repeatedly shown that the benefit of exercise is significant. It can improve almost every side effect from uh, breast cancer therapy, and it can also decrease risk of recurrence and development of new cancers. So we at Duke have multiple collaborative programs that we use to try to focus on improving survivorship care. We have an excellent cancer patient support program that provides free counseling for patients. We have an active smoking cessation program to reduce the risk of developing new cancers and assist with smoking cessation to improve tolerability for breast cancer treatments and open up surgical reconstruction options. We have an oncofertility program to enhance fertility preservation and deal with the downstream fertility effects of many of our breast cancer treatments. We have a sexual health program for survivors of women's cancers, and this is a particular area of interest of mine since everything that we do for breast cancer can cause impact to sexual health. We have a cardio-oncology clinic that's led by uh, my colleague, Dr. Susan Dent. We have a survivorship research group that's led by Kevin Effinger with several projects in the space interfacing between oncologists and primary care providers or this onco-primary care. We interface with the Center for Integrative Medicine that allows us to enhance nutrition services, offer acupuncture, and provide a more holistic focus. And we're working on setting up a multidisciplinary cancer-associated neuropathy clinic. Um, I'll kind of wrap up with just saying that survivorship is a term for care after cancer diagnosis. And I try to encourage my patients to remember that there are solutions for almost every problem if we try hard enough to find them. We can't know what problems exist if we don't hear about them. So communication is key, both patients communicating to providers and providers communicating with one another to coordinate care. You are your best advocate as a patient. If you identify a need and we don't have something to address that need, we wanna know so that we can work better to broaden our services that we offer and to improve these side effects because we know they are significant and quality of life impacting. Um, most of the programs that we have grew out of awareness from patients' needs. So uh, let us know what you need.
Um, and with that, I'll pass it back to Dr. Rosenberger. Thank you, Dr. Westbrook. That was really uh, terrific. And you can see all of the um, impact that a breast cancer diagnosis has on our patients. And it's really great to see all the programs that we have here at Duke and people thinking about these things. So I'm gonna transition um, to introduce our next speaker, which is Dr. Colin Chan. He is an associate professor at Drexel University College of Medicine and one of, was one of our uh, fantastic radiation oncologists here at Duke not too long ago. He leads the Allegheny Health Network as the director of their Cancer Institute Exercise Oncology and Resiliency Center. And they have a full-time facility where breast cancer patients can perform exercise protocol, protocols on research studies, and they have certified strength and conditioning specialists, which sounds awesome. And um, maybe you can uh, help us figure out how to get that, those services here at Duke, but I will turn it over to Dr. Champ uh, for his talk. Thank you. Thanks so much, Dr. Rosenberger. And uh, I, miss, I miss you all very much. So thanks for uh, allowing me to be part of this. So we'll, we'll chat here in about 10 minutes. Um, on exercise before, during, and after uh, breast cancer. And uh, again, thanks thanks for the int intro, and we'll discuss a little bit of what I do at the end. So I always start out with uh, with some good and bad news. Uh, the, the good news on the left is if you follow that green curve there, this is the, the risk of, of uh, being cured, the chances of being cured from breast cancer. And if you look in the 1970s, it's only about 30%, so very humbling numbers. Uh, but as you see, by the time we hit 2010, that 30% was flipped upside down and was a cure rate of, of about uh, 70%. And uh, that, that keeps on, on rising. So early stage breast cancer at this point is, is in the mid nineties in terms of, of cure rates. Um, and then your risk of dying of, of cancer, the black there has significantly decreased as well. That went from 70% down to 30%. So those, those two numbers are flipping. Um, the, the unfortunate thing is, and, and I, I apologize, I, I misspoke um, already. Uh, the, the black is a decrease in risk of dying from cancer. So you see that we're improving significantly from 70 to 30%, uh, but the green here is the risk of dying from something else. So we're curing uh, breast cancer at a much higher rate, um, but women are still dying of something else at similar ages, right? There's not even a lag there. So the question is, what, what's going on? And, and uh, one of our students, Nick Zayorski, looked on the far right here. These are groups of individuals um, that had, were diagnosed with one of the following cancers. And we'll follow the, the pink on there is breast cancer. And the left is 1, 10, or 100. That's 10 times the risk of the normal population. And then that line in between is 50 times the risk of the normal population. And if we follow that over to the right, that pink first pink dot between the ages of 40 to 44 women diagnosed with breast cancer that are cured have a 50 times higher risk of having diabetes than the general population. And so that's partially what's accounting for this increase in risk of death. And so to, to piggyback on Dr. Westbrook's conversation, uh, there's a lot of reasons why that's happening. Some of them is from the treatment for sure. Uh, some of them is from dietary nutrition issues. And then some of them are from decreased activity levels and exercise levels, which again is partially from some of the treatments that we deliver, which can decrease uh, those levels and which can decrease activity levels. So that was the good and the bad. This is the bad, and we'll talk about some more good. Uh, when we slapped activity trackers on patients uh, undergoing radiation therapy for early stage breast cancer and then tracked them afterwards, uh, we found that they only decreased their activity levels by 54 steps per day. So we thought that radiation would really impact uh, an individual's exercise levels, and it really didn't, it barely changed. It was only a decrease of 0.02 miles per day. The issue is the average step count was about 5,000 steps per day. And that, that's not very high. Some, some the, the women were in the 2,000s, uh, some were in the 15,000s. You really want that to be around eight to 10,000. And what we found too is that the average amount of sleep per night on the bottom there was 6.8 hours. That, that's not satisfactory either. I'd, I'd like to say that everyone's getting eight hours of sleep. That's, that's what I strive for. I know that easier said than done. But what this showed us is that there's, there's certainly room for improvement. And this 
this is especially important because we know that the data shows that women that move a lot and women that move often after a diagnosis of breast cancer have a significantly higher chance of being cured and of living long. And as you see on the left here, this is at year one after diagnosis of breast cancer and then year two. The blue line, the aqua line is the risk of recurrence. So women that moved quite a bit had a decreased risk of recurrence by 40% and a decreased risk of dying by 50%. And then at two years, those numbers increased to 55% and then 70%. If you look at the right here, that's a change in mortality. This was the, the amount of activity levels, and that was low, moderate, high. And as you can see, there's a benefit in all of them. That's almost a 60% drop in your risk of death after being treated for breast cancer. If you are very active and intensely active, your risk of dying from breast cancer dropped 70%. This is a quarter-lived study, but nonetheless, those are some very big numbers. So what we've been pushing, and we are pushing this at Duke multiple years ago, and we're starting to push this nationwide, is that not all exercise is the same. So if we want to increase, this is, uh, for example, if we want to increase your mobility, or if we want to increase your quadriceps muscles, because increased muscle mass correlates with better outcomes after treatment for breast cancer, a lot of programs will do this, what this woman in the pink tank top is doing on the left. You're seated, you're doing leg extensions, it burns in your quads, you may build some quad muscle. The question we have is, while that's safe and easy, I could have 50 people doing that under my one watch and the odds of them getting injured is low. Is it effective? The middle here, you see an increase in intensity and mobility. This is called a goblet squat. So when this woman's doing this motion, she's also improving her quadriceps muscles, but she's loading every bone and every joint in her body. So if she's on a medication like Arimidex, which causes bone loss, this middle workout is gonna stimulate bone growth in her hips, and it's gonna stimulate bone growth in her back. This woman on the left will stimulate no bone growth in either of those. And this woman on the right, I always show her picture, I buy butter from her. Uh, she's almost 70 and that's obviously in insane, but that shows you how, how far along the spectrum you can get from simply sitting in a chair to clean and pressing weight over your head. And obviously she's loading every bone in her body and certainly offsetting any, uh, any bone loss that would be happening from an anti-estrogen medication. And this is important, particularly in women with breast cancer, because we know that body composition, more so than weight or BMI, closely correlates with survival. And there's three curves here. And this bottom one on the left, the, the black line or the blue line rather is women that are not sarcopenic. Sarcopenic means low muscle mass. So women with high muscle mass have a significant increase of surviving at 10 years after the treatment for breast cancer. Women with radiodense muscles, so nice and dense muscles without a lot of glycogen in them, uh, live significantly longer as well. And on the bottom right here, adipose tissue or fat tissue, that relationship is completely turned on its head. So more fat tissue means decreased risk of survival at 10 years. So again, when we ask ourselves, what are we eating and what exercises are we doing? It needs to be exercises that increase muscle mass and decrease fat mass. This is again important because of bone density. There's only one way to stop loss of bone density in postmenopausal women or increase bone density in that same population. And that is by causing tension, compression, or shear stress on the bones. And whatever force it takes to fracture your bone, you have to hit 10% of that to cause these cells called osteoblasts to migrate to that area of the bone where these micro fractures occur and then to lay down more collagen and calcium. If you're not hitting 10% of the fracture stress, you will not get that happening. So you will not get an increase in bone mineral density. So if we put you on a treadmill, I'm not saying it's bad for you, but it's not gonna increase your bone mineral density. It's not gonna increase your muscle mass because bone density is proportional to strength. And that's in premenopausal women, that's in postmenopausal women, and that's in forearm bone density, and that's in femoral neck on the right bone density. You see a linear relationship. The stronger women are, the heavier weights they're lifting, the more dense their bones are. And this makes sense, right? The heavier you're lifting, the more you're stressing your bones. It's the same thing for hypertrophy. So again, that woman that was just doing leg extensions, that's fine. But if you take her and make her do squats, like this woman on the left, you're gonna activate every muscle fiber throughout the quadriceps and in your lower extremities. And as you see on the far right here, the more recruitment threshold you reach, i.e. the more muscle fibers you recruit, 
the more strength you're going to see, the more force production you're going to see, and the more you're going to stress those muscle fibers to grow back larger. So what we have women do is reps schemes in one to five or six to 10 reps. And by that fifth or 10th rep, you can't do any more. So it's quite heavy. And that's why you're doing them in our facility so that we're observing and making sure we reduce injury risk. And the issue throughout the breast cancer literature, if you look through, for instance, if we wanna increase muscle mass, you have to hit a threshold. And that hypertrophy threshold is above five sets of a certain muscle group per week and ideally above 10. If you look at every breast cancer study out there, none of them actually reach that map, the, uh, the, the optimal threshold of 10. That would be a purple line hitting here. A lot of them don't even record it. And then some of them, the blue line here, reach that minimal hypertrophy threshold. So that's about half. So if you look through the breast cancer literature, a lot of these studies say there's something about breast cancer patients where they don't get an increase in muscle mass. They don't get an increase in bone mineral density. The reason is we're not pushing them hard enough, right? It's our issue. Our methods are off. And so we're working hardly to fix, uh, working very uh, hard to fix that. And increased muscle mass also increases your resting metabolic rate. And that's been shown again and again. This is a big study from Ponzer at Duke. Whether you're an older adult, a young kid, a woman, a male on the top right here, uh, muscle mass correlates with resting metabolic rate. So the more muscle mass you have, the more calories you burn at rest. And these are just four different examples. It, it is a linear increase. So if we, with an exercise regimen, help you build muscle, we will improve your metabolic function. We will decrease things like diabetes and we will increase the amount of calories you burn at rest. So I only have 10 minutes. I, I could talk about this for hours. So my quick takeaways here are move often, just like that study showed us, move a lot and move better. And by that, I mean, do exercises that will make you move better. Right? Don't just sit on a machine, do squats, uh, those types of movements, and exercise intensely and heavy. Just like with radiation, just like with chemotherapy, we need to elevate the dose so to make sure it's effective. And that is the dose to stimulate bone and muscle growth. So thank, thank you, everyone. And that's, that's, uh, that's my facility here. This is where all of our breast cancer patients uh, exercise during and after treatment. Thank you, Dr. Champ. That was great. And um, I think everyone listening is feeling motivated to get out there and not just walk on their treadmill, but, you know, get back to some more high intensity resistance training. Um, I have some good questions for you when the time is right. Okay, great. Um, we're going to move on uh, to our next uh, speaker set, actually. So our next two speakers will be Mary Alvarado and Lasonia Barnett. And they are our community facing navigators in the Duke Cancer Institute Community Outreach, Engagement and Equity Office. And they're going to talk with us today about patient navigators and the resource that we have available um, to our community. So thank you both for being with us this morning. I will turn it over to you. Thank you so much. It's so nice to be here this morning. Um, as she said, I am Lasagna Barnett and I am the lead community facing patient navigator, um, along with Mary Alvarado, which is our bilingual community facing uh, patient navigator. And our goal today is to talk a little bit further about resources and access to care. So cancer.gov states that delays in screening, the experts warn, could mean that the missed cancers might be larger and more advanced when they are ultimately detected. In general, cancers are easier to treat in an early stage. Now, you know, I must apologize for starting this presentation um, for starting it with uh, COVID you know, something that we're all trying to put behind us. But it was very important for us to make the statement from our office that, you know, you must continue to have your breast cancer as well as your other cancer screenings during COVID. Even though our numbers have gone down, we are still seeing COVID numbers. So, and people are delaying their screenings for one reason or the other. Maybe they have lost insurance, or they still um, do not want to go into a healthcare facility, um, or the fact that it has been canceled during this time. So like we said, delays in screenings may 
you know, worsen outcomes for, um, for screenings. So if your appointment was canceled during COVID, don't forget to reschedule. Very, very important. So let's talk about the importance of primary care providers. So primary care providers will help you manage care and make appropriate referrals to resources and supported services. And some of those um, referrals are specialty care, such as oncologists or therapists or nutritionalists, diagnostic testing, uh, any other needed cancer screening referrals, financial assistance, social workers or navigators or interpreter services. So let's look at ways to access primary care providers for uninsured and underinsured individuals. Um, what we do know is during COVID, a lot of people have lost their health care insurance. And a lot of people feel like they do not have access to care. And so they choose not to go to a health care provider. But that is further from the truth. People have access to federal qualified health care centers or FQHCs or safety net providers. Now, in the Durham County area where we are, Lincoln County Health Center has 10 sites, and that is FQHC. Um, we have located um, here on the slide also their phone number. They operate on a sliding fee scale, which means that they charge according to your income. They can refer to programs to help you access a larger healthcare system as well. FQHCs provide services to anyone, also included undocumented members of the community. To find your local North Carolina FQHC, please see the website or either call the phone number. Now, I must say, if you need assistance in getting connected to a federal qualified health care center, please feel free to reach out to our office. Also, um, for individuals that are underinsured and uninsured, they also can look for their local health departments. And here we have the website as well as the customer service center phone number for individuals to find their local health department. Now, also in North Carolina, the North Carolina Association of Free and Charitable Clinics, we have located here on the slide, we have their, um, their website as well as their phone number. And so there are several free and charitable clinics within North Carolina. That's a really, really great resource. Now, patient navigators from our office can help you with this program. And this is a program that you're gonna hear about a little bit later in the more information section. And this program is one that I really, really love. This is the North Carolina Breast and Cervical Cancer Control Program, better known as VSEP. And the eligibility for this program, you have to be uninsured or underinsured, without Medicaid or Medicare Part B. And the ages for the breast screening services are from 21 to 64. You must have a household income at or below 250% of the federal poverty level. And an application has to be made by a BSEP provider. BSEP services, it provides cervical cancer screenings such as pap test or HPV test, clinical breast exams, screening breast exams, screening mammograms or diagnostic procedures um, to include diagnostic mammograms, ultrasounds, colposcopies, breast and cervical biopsies. They also provide medical consultations. And here we lo have located on this slide, the website as well as their phone number. Now, here is the map of the North Carolina breast and cervical cancer control areas. Um, and in on this map, it shows you where they're located. Um, it also shows you, um, it, if you see on the map, you see hearts on this map as well. That's the North Carolina Wise Woman Program. And you're gonna hear about that next from Mary. Um, and they can go in conjunction with the BSEP program. It's a very good program. And so Mary, um, take it away. You can talk about 
the North Carolina Wise Women Program. Good morning, everyone, and thank you for joining us today. In this slide, we're going to provide you with some resources or um, phone numbers and emails, uh, websites for the NC Wise Women. They can be used in conjunction with uh, BICEPs for women's ages 40 to 64. Their assistance is for low income, underinsured, uninsured. It is to improve physical health as it relates to cardiovascular and other um, chronic diseases. Here's the website if you would like to get um, more information on their website or their phone number as well. Uh, you can also access Project Access and their initiative is to provide access to specialty care for low income uninsured individuals. And they are locally located in Durham and in Wake counties. We have also Pretty in Pink. They have treatment financial assistance for North Carolina breast cancer also uninsured and underinsured patients. And their website is here in the slide also and their phone number. Next slide, please. Other resources also, it could be the American Cancer Society. Um, their support services includes understanding your diagnosis, finding and paying for treatment, treatment and side effects, survivorship during and after treatment, caregivers and family, children and cancer, and of life care and you can also find support programs and services in your area and the way that you can look it up is by uh, searching for your resources by zip code city and state and in this slide as well is the website that you can log in and get more information and their phone number as well next uh, slide please we have also resources from the center for disease control and prevention you can learn more about it about covid and cancer kinds of cancer, the national programs, educational campaigns, resource library, preventing cancer, survivorship and cancer givers, uh, data and statistics, risk factors, and the website is also in here in this slide and their phone number. Next slide. <clears throat> you can also contact us as Lasania stated a little bit earlier. We are the Duke Cancer Institute Community Outreach and Engagement and Equity. We are a community facing patient navigator uh, navigation services and the services that we provide is assistance and resources to overcome barriers to prevent cancer or cancer prevention, education and screenings. We connect our patients uh, regardless if they are uninsured, underinsured, undocumented, and we connect them to primary care for cancer screenings. We promote cancer screenings for early detections through uh, community events. We also provide guidance about participation in clinical trials, uh, trials, I'm sorry. And you can contact us at our office at 919-684-0409 or our uh, website, it's on the bottom of the slide. Uh, next slide, please. You can also contact if you feel more comfortable, you can call Lasania Barnett. Her phone number is 919-684-4056. Or Nadia, she is also a bilingual uh, community facing patient navigator. Her phone number is 919-668-8606 or myself, 919-668-1577. Thank you for joining us today. Thank you so much. <clears throat> I was just uh, taking a look at the chat and thank you for people putting your questions in there. We'll get to as many of them as possible at the end. Um, Mary and Lasonia, I really appreciate um, your being here today and all the services that are provided. This is a really, really important area. And um, as a system, we need to continue to provide as many uh, resources to really provide health equity, which is um, critically important. Thank you, Dr. Um, Rosenberger. Good to be here today. Thank you. So we'll shift to our um, last speaker of this session, and um, I will be introducing uh, Dr. Jeffrey Marks. He is the Joseph and Dorothy Beard Distinguished Professor of Experimental Surgery here at Duke, and he's been studying molecular biology of breast and ovarian cancers since joining faculty here in 1988, and he's worked with a wide array of both clinicians and scientists to better understand these diseases. So thanks so much for being with us, Dr. Marks, and I'll turn over the mic. Thank you. 
Thanks for having me. And let's see. So um, I was asked to talk about breast cancer research, which is obviously a pretty big thing. Um, it's been a big thing in my life for the last 35 years or so. Um, this is a uh, slide I like to show that just sort of demonstrates the, the amount of research <laughs> that's going on in cancer and in breast cancer specifically. So this is the number of scientific publications that have um, cancer in the title or breast or lung or colorectal cancer in the title. And in, and in uh, 2021, last year, there were over 15,000 new pu publications that describe something about breast cancer. So the idea of um, summar summarizing breast cancer research is um, <laughs> tricky to say the least. Um, but uh, what this de demonstrates is that what we're really doing is we're, we're studying breast cancer very intensely. Um, there, this is a reflection of, uh, a direct reflection of literally how much, um, how much research funding goes into these various diseases. So um, if anybody tells you there's not enough research going on, um, I guess that's true. There's always, there's, there could always be more, but there is a lot of research going on. So what I want to talk about is, a, um, is one slice of this research um, and give a little historical perspective and, um, and, and just sort of highlight the success and, and still gaps in, in our understanding of breast cancer. So uh, this is a, um, a family pedigree. Uh, it's what we would call a classic uh, pedigree that's associated with the breast cancer susceptibility gene, BRCA1 where um, affected individuals are um, in, with a black uh, filled um, and unaffected individuals are, are unfilled. And you can see in this uh, sample pedigree that there is both breast and ovarian cancer and it's, it's being diagnosed at a relatively young age. This is, a, this is sort of a classic pedigree that, has, uh, that was prompted uh, uh, many people to study um, familial breast cancer, familial breast and ovarian cancer. Um, and this is a timeline of that um, of the, the study and the discovery of BRCA1. So in um, <clears throat> in uh, as, as early as 1866, uh, a French uh, scientist uh, described familial breast cancer. Um, modern, more modern times, uh, uh, the epidemiologic research demonstrated that there were familial clusters of breast and ovarian cancer and first degree relatives. And, and this timeline actually focused on Mary Claire King, who was instrumental in the discovery of BRCA1. And she started her work um, in 1974. The key events were that she found um, the gene that um, appeared to be responsible for BRCA1 located on chromosome 17. And um, it took from 1990 to uh, 1994 to finally discover the gene. So this is prior to having the entire human genome sequenced. So things were a lot more laborious back in the 90s. And it took four years to find BRCA1. And this was found through the collection of numerous uh, family pedigrees and many, many scientists uh, uh, looking very intensely for this gene. Interestingly, um, it only took a few more months after BRCA1 was found to find BRCA2. So in September of that year, BRCA2 was reported. Um, and, and that was largely because uh, the families that um, harbored BRCA1 mutations um, were then said, okay, well, these are all BRCA1 mutations. And the remainder then were, were realized, okay, well, there must be some other gene involved and BRCA2 was, was re relatively quickly found. Uh, just, just to finish this off, uh, Myriad Genetics started offering BRCA1 testing, and they, they patented the gene, and then the Supreme Court kind of overruled that. You can't really patent human genes. Okay, so Eureka, now what? Um, well, genetic testing uh, is routine now, particularly in families with significant breast and ovarian cancer incidents. This is actionable information. So, you know, doing, doing testing is, is of no value unless you can do something about it. So we have early and improved screening, including breast MRI. Prophylactic surgery is an option. Um, I, I, I note here ovary fallopian tubes and breast. So it turns out that, um, that ovarian cancer really is not ovarian cancer. It's actually fallopian tube cancer. 
Um, and this is something that was only realized in the last oh, 10 or 15 years. So up until that point, uh, people believed that the cancer was actually uh, uh, coming from the surface of the ovary. It turns out it's coming actually from the fallopian tubes. Other uh, treatment approaches that target the target a function of BRCA1. So this is a success not only in, in screening, but in, um, in, thera in therapy. What about families that don't have clear-cut BRCA1 mutations? There are plenty of families where it looks like breast cancer is actually running through the family in some sort of uh, uh, hereditary fashion. And again, BRCA2 was discovered in some of these families, and there are some other uh, relatively lower penetrance genes that were also found in some of these families. But in fact, since breast cancer is such a common disease, some of these family clusters may just represent coincidence rather than having a bad gene. Again, if, uh, if, the, if, there's, if the cancer is that prevalent in the, in the population, there are always going to be uh, what look like, look like family clusters, but may, may just represent bad luck. Um, and then there are a number of many, many variants of BRCA1 that we don't really know. We, they may, may, or not, may or may not be related to the cancer, and we call these uh, variants of uncertain significance. So just again, the magnitude of, of BRCA1 um, and, uh, and cancer incidence, uh, there is almost a 50% chance of developing breast cancer by age 50. General population at that point is about 2%. By age 70, it can be up to 80, 80 or so percent um, in BRCA1 carriers. And as I said, ovarian cancer is another feature of this. Actually, it's not ovarian, it's fallopian tube cancer is another feature of this syndrome. Um, and um, women carrying uh, BRCA1 mutations can have up to about 40 or 50% risk of developing ovarian cancer by age 70, whereas the population incidence is quite low of ovarian cancer. So um, this is where the research comes in beyond just, okay, we've discovered BRCA1 and, and, um, and it, it, is use, it has all sorts of utility. Um, but from my standpoint as a, as a scientist who's been trying to understand this disease all these years, the eureka moment really was, okay, BRCA1, when it's mutated, gives rise to these very specific cancers, breast cancer and fallopian tube cancer. So one would suspect that once we found this gene, that there would be some deep understanding that would be uh, that that would come with with finding this gene that would give us some clues as to why why breast cancer what is BRCA1 role in actually specifically in breast cancer um, so again it's uh, it is re results in a, a dramatic increase in breast and ovarian or fallopian tube cancer maybe a slight increase in prostate cancer as well there are plenty of other hereditary cancer syndromes. Um, so BRCA1 is not the only, uh, breast cancer is not the only hereditary cancer syndrome. Subsets of lots of solid cancers have familial uh, syndromes that are associated with them, including colon and endometrial and so on and so forth. Um, most blood cancers do not though, it's interesting. Um, so solid cancers uh, are commonly have these family syndromes, whereas leukemias and lymphomas typically do not. So as I said, the identity and function of these genes, not just for BRCA1, but other genes that are uh, related to family cancer syndromes should hold basic clues to the nature of these cancers. That was the promise from a research standpoint of discovering BRCA1 uh, over and above all of, the, all of the clinical and practical applications. So BRCA1 is a big complicated gene, it really is. Uh, from, from me working in molecular biology, uh, genes are our are, are language, and BRCA1 it brings to the table a new word, essentially, a new word in our language. So when we looked at it, uh, it was this big gene that didn't really have any obvious identity when we compared it to all the other genes we knew about. Um, mutations in the gene, in the germline, uh, hereditary mutations occur all throughout the gene, uh, that's what these uh, red and yellow boxes are under this under the gene. And in fact, you can lose as little as the last 10 amino acids of this of this 3500 amino acid protein, and this will result in a um, in a, a non-functional gene, at least as far as uh, breast cancer goes. So the gene itself uh, provides a lot of research opportunities, but it didn't immediately demonstrate, okay, well, this is the obvious reason why BRCA1 causes breast cancer. 
So um, yeah, there are lots of genes. So the first thing we do is always to see, well, does it look like any other gene we know about? And as I said, not really. Um, well, the other, the next thing we said, well, maybe the breast and the ovary slash fallopian tube cells are the only cells that make this gene. Okay, maybe it's specifically made in these cells and that's why it causes breast and ovarian cancer, fallopian tube cancer. And no, that's not the case. So BRCA1 is expressed widely throughout uh, in, in the body. Um, well, what, what's, what's unique about the breast and ovary and fallopian tube? Well, they are both responsive to female hormones. So maybe the gene has something to do with estrogen or progesterone or estrogen and progesterone have something to do with this gene. And the answer to that is still maybe. Um, there are certainly plenty of clues that, that, that point to that, but there's nothing concrete. And finally, is there something special about the type of breast cancer that forms in the context of a BRCA1 mutation? And there the answer is clearly yes. Um, there is a, a, pro a propensity for um, triple negative cancers to form in the context of BRCA1 mutation. So that has always been a, a clue that um, is sitting there right in front of us, um, but, but still remaining somewhat elusive in terms of, of the answer. The answer being, why does BRCA1 cause breast and ovarian cancer? So um, the one clear uh, path pathway that we've taken and that has been discovered over and over again is that BRCA1 is involved in the response to DNA damage. So DNA damage is the, uh, the one of the primary causes, if one could say that, of cancer in general. It's common, DNA damage happens normally, naturally, and it does increase uh, mutation load, the mutate, number of mutations. Um, things can increase uh, number of DNA damage, such as various chemicals and radiation, and cells have evolved a number of ways of fixing this damage. So this is, again, a normal process and cells fix this routinely because it is a normal process. Um, among the many apparent functions of BRCA1 is a role in one of the important pathways of DNA repair. And this, re and this pathway is called homologous recombination. It's the most um, error-free, what we call error-free um, mechanism for repairing DNA. So it repairs it very with high fidelity. And BRCA1 appears to play a role in homologous recombination. And then the accumulation of mutations is a hallmark of cancer. So one could then make this direct sort of line from, okay, you lose BRCA1 um, or you lose BRCA1 function, which leads to a decrease in the ability of a cell to repair its DNA and therefore leads to an increase in the number of mutation, which would lead to a increase in the number of cancers. And that all makes sense, and nobody has poked a hole in that theory. However, what remains is why breast and ovarian and fallopian tube cancer specifically. This still remains the missing piece of the puzzle. So while we've had BRCA1 in our hands for 28, 20, yeah, no, 28 years now, 28 years since the discovery of BRCA1, we still don't know why it is directly responsible for these two very specific cancer types. And this is, again, highlights to me the, both the, the, um, the success of, of research and also the maddening sort of elusive nature of these, these big questions and big answers that, 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 that still remain. So in summary, um, breast cancer research is an extraordinarily active field. It truly is. There, there are many, many people out there working on breast cancer as diligently as possible. Uh, progress can be measured in many ways, and you've heard lots of progress today, this morning, um, and the most important progress clearly is reducing the burden of the disease. And we have, we've, we've reduced uh, disease-specific mortality through what is likely a combination of improved detection and treatment. Um, and our understanding of the disease has dramatically increased. I mean, there is no question we now understand the disease much better than we did 25 or 30 years ago. However, um, there is still these elusive aspects of the disease and the general complexity of biology and the amazing variation of the disease itself really makes the, the, the next steps um, still very difficult. And I would leave this with, with everyone that is that, that each cancer 
is in my mind, a snowflake. They are all different. Every cancer that grows in somebody's body is different from the person next to them that might have a cancer also growing in their body. So the cancers are unique. And then you have to consider that we are, as humans, we're, we're outbred and free range, and we are all unique. And so you've got unique cancers growing within unique individuals. And that combination uh, is, is a, a daunting combination of what we would consider lots of heterogeneity, which makes making generalizations very, very tricky. And I will stop there. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Marks. <clears throat> Thanks for all the work in this space and um, for that great overview. We've made so much progress in the last decade or two, and I look forward to seeing what's you know coming down the pike. So we have just a few minutes for questions, and we have lots coming through the chat. Um, I'm going to uh, pick off one question first for Dr. Westbrook. And um, there's some questions regarding the later phases of survivorship and how to help return patients to normalcy. And one of the specific questions, um, are there therapists that specialize specifically in um, emotional problems and, and transitions in that space? And I think you're muted still. Yeah, my favorite maneuver. Once again. Um, so our cancer patient support program is uh, staffed by many psychologists and uh, LMFTs who all have a particular interest in the emotional challenges that come with cancer diagnosis. So um, you could be referred to any of them through any Duke provider, um, but then there also is a phone number. And I, if you go through the Q&A, I think I put it in somewhere to call to access cancer patient support on your own. Um, if, you, if you would like to do that, there are some issues with certain providers being able to provide virtual care across state lines. So uh, there was a question about that and I would specifically call the cancer patient support program to ask about that. Um, yeah, thank you. Mm -hmm. we, you know, as we um, saw from La Sonia and Mary, we have a lot of support services, um, both in community outreach and resources, but also those who are already connected to the system from physical therapy to um, sexual health, with Dr. Westbrook's special program. And so just asking your provider what, what might exist um, is usually the first best step. Um, I'll direct the next um, question to Lasagna and Mary. There was a question regarding some thresholds um, about qualifications, and specifically someone was asking, what is the sort of ballpark of 250% of the poverty level? And I think people are often wondering, well, do I qualify? And so maybe you can also um, let people know how they can figure those things out. And I know you put a lot of resources mm -hmm. in the slides, but Right, right. Great question. Um, I think in the question and answer section, they were asking for a family of four. Is that correct? Okay. So um, annually, that would be $69,375. And if we're looking at it monthly, that's about $5,781. Um, but there actually is online. You can take a look at it and you can look at the limits for breast and cervical cancer control, um, federal poverty um, numbers for 2022. And so, you know, you can see um, where you would fall within that range. Thank you. Um, and yeah, I, I have a question here, a couple questions in the chat um, that I'll direct to Dr. Cham. Um, the first is regarding what programs exist here at Duke, and just notably that Dr. Champ was with us um, and is not here uh, now, but um, is clearly a national expert in this space. So maybe you can comment what, what is available at most sites, which is probably not anything near what you have available there. Um, and then how do people get started? So if there's not a formal program at one's institution, what can people do um, if they're not already active and doing resistance training and maybe have some intimidation about the gym. Yeah, yes. So Duke, Duke has at the integrative center, there are programs there. 
Um, and I think those are a good start. Uh, what I will say is the, the gym is not for everyone. And that, that's kind of why we set this up. And that's why we initially set it up at the Diet and Fitness Center at Duke. Um, sports performance centers actually are more up close and personal. And so that's how we train the women here, right? We, th this sounds a bit silly, but you know, we, we train you like a professional athlete, right? We all have a goal. What's your goal? Your goal is to offset bone loss. Your goal is to increase muscle mass. And then you sit down with a coach and they go through it with you. And it's at these types of centers, it's more up close and personal. It's less intimidating. It's not a room full of 500 people with the meatheads in the corner. It's, it's just you and that coach, or maybe you and a couple other people in that coach. So that would be a sports performance center. And there, there are some of those around uh, the Durham area and there are some in the Raleigh area as well, but for a good start, integrative medicine at Duke. And then if you want to start to push things, I would do those, those types of centers because it's safer and those, those coaches are more uh, qualified. And especially if they're a certified strength and conditioning specialist, those are going to be the highest degreed individuals that, that, that could train you. Great. Thanks, Dr. Champ. And um, one question I'll direct at Dr. Marks, and then I think we need to shut it down for time. Um, there's a question in the chat regarding fallopian tubes versus ovaries and um, what is important. So um, some folks have hysterectomy with everything. Some just have hysterectomy in uh, fallopian tubes. And what are people's risk um, for things like ovarian cancer and fallopian tube cancer? Maybe can give just a 30 second overview of that topic. Yeah, so the, the cancer arises, the, the, what's called high grade serous cancer arises in the distal fallopian tube. It's the, the part of the fallopian tube that catches the egg as it's bursting out of the ovary. The ovary goes through this process every menstrual cycle of, of, of rupture. So what happens is that, um, that there may be some capture of pieces of the fallopian tube within the ovary um, and that's why it looks like the cancer is actually arising in the ovary. I think the safe, the safest bet in a prophylactic surgery is, is to remove the ovaries and the fallopian tubes. So, I mean, I think that's, that's the current uh, uh, guidelines for this. Um, it, it's the, the cancer could have already sort of started and, and growing in the ovary. So it makes sense to take out both um, when when and if uh, the patient or the person decides that this is the right course of action. Yeah, and I think we have some fantastic collaborators in gynecologic oncology, and um, we work very closely with them, uh, as well as our medical oncologists. So those are great, very specific questions based on your age and your menopausal status um, and your cancer history. So, um, all right, I will turn the table back over to Dr. Plitka. Thank you for letting me participate in this session. Yeah, and thank you again to this last set panel. Uh, fantastic presentations again. We're so glad that you could all be here with us today. Some of you coming back to us from other places. And uh, it's just been great to see all of you this morning. Uh, so that actually closes down all of our formal uh, breast education sessions. I have a couple slides I'm gonna share and then we're gonna jump over to our more information panel. Um, so first, I just again, wanna say thank you to all the attendees for joining us today. I'd also like to say thank you again to our presenting sponsor, Invitae. I'd like to take a moment to thank our planning committee, including Jackie White, Sydney Record, Demisha Thompson, Kathy Trotter, the Community Engagement Task Force, and the Community Outreach and Engagement and Equity Office through DCI. Uh, for those of you that like to get a little exercise, hopefully Dr. Champ has inspired you, uh, come join us for the Making Strides Against Breast Cancer Walk, which will be held on Saturday, October 22nd at 8 a.m. at the Briar Creek Corporate Center. Uh, and there is a Duke Cancer Institute team, which is actually co-captained co by uh, Jackie White, one of the people with us today, and then Dr. Menendez, one of the other breast surgeons here at Duke. Uh, please remember that there is a survey that you will get uh, an opportunity to fill out when you leave the webinar today. Please, please, please do send us your feedback. We really appreciate it. If you want to keep up to date with what's happening on with our, what's happening with our group, you can visit our website at breasthealth.duke.edu, and there will be uh, links there to the recording uh, from today's session. And then now we're going to transition over to our more information panel, uh, and so I'm going to switch slides to that. Uh, feel free to join us for that, but if you'd like to go, feel free, and I just want to say a final thank you. So I'm going to pull up my other slides, so give me just a moment here.
right, let's see here. One more set of slides and then we will be wrapping it up. Give me just a second here, almost there. Appreciate your patience today with all the technology. All right, Scott. You've been doing a great job, Jen. <laughs> just a little bit of coordination. Hardly a hitch. Yeah, hardly at all. All right, so these are our last set of slides. So if you've still got questions, we're still here for you. We still got answers. Uh, so we're gonna go ahead and invite some of our uh, sponsors and support teams to go ahead and contribute some things. So our first one, again, is gonna be our presenting sponsor in Vitae. Uh, and I believe Crystal Fogelman is with us today. Um, let me just uh, pull up my participants if I can and make sure I can find her. Oh, I can't. Give me just a second. Oh, here she is. All right, Crystal, are you with us? Are you able to turn on your sound? I am. Hi, Dr. Clickna. Hi, how are you today? I'm doing well, thank you. Great. Thank you for having us and thank you for um, the very warm welcome throughout the presentation. It has been such an incredible presentation as always. It's been it's been nice throughout the 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 years that we've been a part to be able to sponsor this to see how it's grown. So always such great information that you're given the community. And I just wanted to tell everyone that beyond this incredible conference, it's such a privilege to work with you, your other surgeons, your oncologists, genetic counselors, navigators, other clinicians each and every day to ensure that patients and families have access to genetic testing that they need. It happens every time. Um, to ensure that patients and um, their families have access to the testing call never a barrier. Um, I'm so sorry. Oh, Crystal, I think we're losing you a little bit. Your sound's cutting out. Will you play the video, Dr. Plekta? Yeah, I will. Hold on just a second. Let me switch screens again. Uh, let's see. Let me pull up this. I'll share this screen. All right, and then here's the video. Genes aren't just a bond shared by family. Genes bond our past to our future. They guide our health and shape who we are and who we become. That's why thousands of scientists spent millions of hours mapping billions of combinations so we could read the human genome. To most, it looks like nothing more than a string of A's, C's, T's, and G's. But to us, it spells a groundbreaking approach to healthcare. One that gives a father the power to overcome disease so he can run alongside his children. Power for a mother to give her baby the best start. At Invite, We've been a part of more than a million of these moments. We have helped shape the science of medical genetics and witness firsthand the life-changing power it creates. Our genes can be a wake-up call or an early warning. Our genes can guide us to more personalized treatment sooner. We want to give millions of moms, dads, husbands, wives, brothers, and sisters that power of health too. Our mission is to make genetic information affordable and accessible to each and every one of you. Because when you understand your genes, you can take charge of your health. Invite from Genetics Health. Thank you so much. Um, and I apologize about that. Amazon comes every day. I don't know why the dogs don't know them, but thank you for letting us be a partner, um, not only for this event, for you and your patients every day, and for letting us um, make this genetic information a part of um, your patient's journey. So thank you. Yeah, and thank you for joining us. All right, so I think uh, next up we have Community in Motion. And uh, for this group, we have uh, Robin with us today. Uh, this is uh, Robin McCall, who is the Executive Director for Community in Motion. Uh, and Andrea Avila, I think, might be here. Let me just uh, pull up the participant list and see if I can allow you to speak. Give me just a second. Uh, Robin, there you are. So you should be able to talk now, Robin. Hi, can you hear us? I can. Okay, yes, uh, Andre is here with me. Okay. Hi, there, Andre Avila. Uh, we are Community in Motion. Uh, we are a small nonprofit that actually we are uh, small but mighty. 
Uh, so we're based in here in Raleigh, but we do programs all over the world. And our uh, mission statement really is that we build community and improve well-being through adaptive and inclusive movement. So uh, what we do for cancer survivors, and uh, by the way, I'm uh, this month celebrating 10 years cancer-free. I had my Yay. last chemo at Duke 10 years ago this month. So congrats. Uh, this is very personal to me, but we do uh, what we call healthy movements for cancer survivors, and that's um, dance, fitness, breathing, all kinds of physical activity um, with, with music and fun. Um, and it really helps address a lot of the issues back in the survivorship uh, panel when he spoke to the fact that long-term survivorship has not only physical, but you know cognitive, psychological, and social long-term complications. Our programs really address all of those in a in a really fun and engaging way. And we've had a whole lot of success with people joining us again from all over the world, both online and in person, to just get moving and have fun together. And you can see a few pictures here. We teach all ages and abilities, so we have lots of different programs. But as you can see, like the upper right is a Zoom shot there. And that was one of our cancer survivor programs where everybody's doing some stretching from uh their various living rooms and things in the middle of COVID. Yeah, it's very important to exercise, but it's very important to exercise in a way where you also get to distract your mind and you get to uh, go to a happy place through music. Uh, we do all of our activities. We constantly uh, uh, do visualizations of different scenarios. So we have, when you have a storytelling factor with music and with movement, then you have a very comprehensive uh, activity that is not only uh, very beneficial for your body, uh, but for your soul and your mind. And we would love for you to visit our website and our Facebook and all of those things to see what we have going on. We have a new, um, another session of our healthy movements. We call it healthy movements mashup because it's a combination of, uh, again, dance, fitness, breathing, fun, social activities. Um, that's a virtual program. And our next session is October 29th. So go to our website to see about that. It's free, 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 and open to anybody. Um, that session will be presented in English, but we also do programs in Spanish. So, and we're completely mobile. We travel everywhere. So if anybody is uh, not in North Carolina or in North Carolina and would like to talk to us about coming to your group or organization and doing some fun activity, please reach out to us because we just want to reach as many people as possible with this, this fun way to get moving and really help you feel better no matter where you are in your cancer journey. Thank you. Thank you so much for joining us today. Really appreciate it. There will be an email that'll go out to all attendees uh, at about a week after the webinar with a link to things and some additional materials. So please do share uh, your upcoming events. Maybe you have a flyer you can share that I can pass on to the attendees. Okay, thank you thank very you. much. All right. Uh, as you've noticed, uh, I happen to be a breast surgeon, and so a lot of the speakers today also happen to be breast surgeons. So we are very well represented on today's event, and we will be around to answer a few more questions. Uh, but then the next organization I'd like to introduce is FORCE. Uh, and with us today from FORCE, we have uh, Dr. Whalen. Hi. Yeah, thank you so much. Um, so uh, everyone, I'm Andrea Wallens. I'm one of the FORCE outreach leaders for the Triangle of North Carolina. If you haven't heard, FORCE is an organization for um, individuals and families facing hereditary cancers, specifically breast, ovarian, pancreatic, prostate, colorectal, and endometrial cancers. Um, we provide uh, education and resources for folks in our community, which include people with the BRCA, ATM, PALB2, CHECK2, P10, or other inherited gene mutation, and those diagnosed with Lynch syndrome. Next slide, please. We have many resources, which you can find um, on the link on the slides, which can be sent out, or if you go to our website, facingourrisk.org, we have links to support groups, peer navigation, clinical trials, surgery guides, um, and many other things that are relevant for the hereditary cancer community. Um, we also um, engage in advocacy and other um, volunteering, um, and so all that information can be found on our website. Next slide, please. Um, here are some other uh, uh, information for you to connect with FORCE to know that you are not alone and there's a strong community out here for those facing hereditary cancer. Again, our website is facingourrisk.org. We have a support uh, group, Facebook, um, facingourrisk.org uh, slash support. When you look in Facebook, we have a general email and Twitter and Instagram. So please connect with us here. And then last slide. Um, this is some information about your local North Carolina folks here. We have Wendy and Charlotte and then uh, me and Haley here in uh, 
Raleigh Durham area, um, we put on uh, monthly support groups. Um, the one that's coming up is actually a national event where, where we will have a um, certified uh, massage therapist come and do some uh, gentle movement and mindfulness with us on October 19th. And the link to register for that is on the slide there. Um, we also have uh, recovery supplies uh, post-surgery um, for folks who need it. So you don't have to, uh, you know, uh, buy a bunch of post-op equipment. We have lots of that that folks have donated. And if you have uh, things that you'd like to donate, we will take those as well. Um, but yeah, that's uh, that's all I have today. I really appreciate your time and um, please do not hesitate to reach out if you'd like to learn more. Thanks so much for being here today. Always good to see you. Uh, so the next organization we have uh, is Karis Life Sciences. And from uh, Karis today, we have Dr. Celia Reynolds, who is a molecular science liaison. And I believe Meredith Dolan, also from Karis Life Science, are joining us. So uh, uh, Dr. Reynolds, if you have a few words. Yes, thank you so much, Dr. Plichta. Um, I, I do believe Meredith is with us. But as uh, Dr. Plichta stated, I'm a molecular, molecular science liaison. Um, and basically, that means that I work to support oncologists and researchers in providing precision medicine to patients with cancer. Um, I did uh, receive my medical degree and training at Duke, um, so I'm very happy and, and very proud to be uh, taking part in what's breast for breast this year. Um, as was explained by the experts earlier, acquired changes in genetic machinery can sometimes lead to cancer. And as Dr. Marks clarified, there are lots of genes and lots of ways genes can be mutated. And just like no two snowflakes are alike, no two cancers are alike. So Keras is the original comprehensive molecular profiling laboratory that analyzes all of the coding DNA in a tumor, but also all of the coding RNA and proteins to better understand individual cancer at a molecular level. I do want to clarify because it can get a little confusing. Um, this is somatic or tumor mutations as opposed to germline or inherited mutations. So if you have a question about that, I can answer that, but I definitely urge you to talk to your provider about the difference. But ultimately, this information can help oncologists figure out where the error in the cells may be occurring and what treatments may be the most effective. So we can also identify therapies that may not have been considered, determine drugs that may not have any benefit, match patients to clinical trials, and also identify patients who qualify for new drugs when they become available in the future. So depending on your specific situation, your doctor will determine whether you are a good candidate for comprehensive tumor testing. Um, and if you are a physician or a researcher, um, we have an established research relationship with Duke um, and we're always around to take questions and discuss any ideas that you have. So thank you very much for your time and allowing us to take part and please feel free to reach out with any questions. Excellent, thank you so much for being here today. Thank uh, you for having us. So the next group you've already heard from, uh, but I'll just let them say a quick hello if they would like. We have, uh, used to be called, I apologize, the Office of Health, Health Equity, <clears throat> and it's now called uh, the Community Outreach Engagement and Equity Team. Uh, so uh, Lasagna and uh, Mary, if you wanted to say another hello. Sure. Thank you so much, Jennifer. And thank you for inviting us to What's Best for Breast. This has been wonderful. Um, what I'd like to say is that our office does um, several things. As I talked about, we have community-facing patient navigators. So you will find us in a lot of communities across North Carolina, sharing information in regards to cancer screenings and early detection. Um, also, our goal is to meet communities where they they are and to find out what their needs are in regards to cancer. Um, we also are able to receive referrals from individuals in, the, in our communities in regards to being connected to primary care providers in order to receive cancer screenings. Um, we also have what is called our Community Health Ambassador Training. This is a free a four-hour training that we provide to community and faith-based members in regards to cancer. Um, and we look at five different cancers when we do that training. Um, we also train a little bit about uh, diabetes and hypertension. And after the training is over, we do encourage individuals to stay connected to our office. It's not a one and done. So there are several things that we do. Uh, Mary, I do not know if you'd like to share anything. 
I want to thank you guys for um, having us. This is actually my first uh, event and I uh, learn a lot also. And um, I'm going to, I made notes to also provide um, information and resources that I learned from today's meeting or today's event to uh, our patients as well. And um, so just thank you. Well, thank you thank both you for being so much, here. Mary. Yep. All right, then our last organization uh, is going to be BSEP or the North Carolina Breast and Cervical Cancer Control Program. And I believe we have both Aaron Brown and Sherry Wright with us, but I think Aaron, you had a few words you wanted to say. Yeah, I sure did. Thank you for having me. Um, I just wanted to give a quick overview of NCB stuff and what that is. So um, I'm not able to share my screen. I had a couple slides, but that's okay. Oh, uh, here, hold on just a second. Do, 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 do. Oh, did it not work? I tried to switch you over to a panelist. Are you a panelist now? Oh, there you are. Okay, great. And then if I make you a co-host, and then I can stop sharing, and now you should be able to. Perfect. Can let's see. You guys see my screen now? Not yet. Ooh. There we go. It's coming. There we go. Now we see it. Perfect. Sorry about that. Okay. So NCBCEP is short for the North Carolina Breast and Cervical Cancer Control Program. What we are is a uh, federally and state funded program that provides free and low cost screenings for and diagnostic workup for breast and cervical cancers. Um, we've been in operation since 1992, and this was the first funded chronic disease screening program in the United States. Our goal is to reduce the morbidity and mortality due to breast and cervical cancers in women by providing these screening and diagnostic services for women who live in North Carolina. A um, couple um, requirements here, agent income. We're funded through the CDC. So to receive NCB services, women must be, for the breast screening services, be asymptomatic women between the ages of 40 to 64. And for cervical cancer screening services, um, 21 to 64 is the age for that. Income, like was mentioned previously, um, below 250% of the federal po poverty level and you need to be uninsured or underinsured, and that's defined as unable to afford your copay or deductible. Right, for a woman to be eligible for breast cancer Medicaid, which covers the treatment, you have to be, you have to meet all the North Carolina BSEP eligibility criteria and be enrolled in NC BSEP. Um, and I believe I skipped a slide. Let me go back. Nope, I didn't have the last one. Um, so these are the qualifications for breast cancer Medicaid. Um, they can pay for breast and or cervical cancer treatment. Um, it is important to note that um, while undocumented patients can receive BSEP services, they can't get the payments for the treatment. So we'd have to find other avenues for them. This is a list of our service areas and counties as Lasagna previously mentioned. And if you live in a county where we don't provide services, we can work with a BSEP navigator to get you enrolled in a neighboring county. This is our website for more information. Thank you for having us today. Um, we really appreciate it being a part of the planning party. Yeah, it was so great to have you here, and we really appreciate all of our sponsors and support teams for being here. Um, couldn't do this without you, so uh, again, just thank you so much for uh, being here and joining us today. We do have about another five minutes. If there are any questions that any of the attendees would like to ask, you can put them in the Q&A. You could probably even raise your hand at this point. Um, whatever we can do, we got a few more minutes, and we'll stay on if we can answer any more questions. If not, thank you so much for joining us today, and we hope you'll join us next year. Please do remember to fill out the survey when you leave the webinar. And Dr. Plicta, I wanted to thank you and your team again for a job very well done. Uh, this is an important opportunity this month to um, make yourself more aware of the risk factors for breast cancer and how to keep your, yourself and um, all of your friends and family 
uh, safe. So um, thank you so much for everything you've done for putting this together for our community. Of course, of course, couldn't take it without, couldn't do it without the amazing team that we have. So I don't see any questions coming in. I didn't see any hands go up. So I think with that, we're going to go ahead and close down the webinar. Thank you again, everybody for joining us. I hope you have a great rest of the weekend. Take care. Hopefully we'll see everyone in person next year. That's right. Bye, Bye everyone. Guys.